Yeah. All right. All right. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stand. I like that we have the police officer to talk. Good evening and welcome to the Federal Way City Council meeting for March 19th of 2024. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, good evening. We've got a lot of uh, important new uh, business uh, to uh, cover. Um, let's uh, start with one of the most uh, exciting uh, things we get to do, which is swear in our new police officers. Uh, Chief? Yeah, good evening, Mayor Farrell, Council President Kochmar, and Council members. It's my pleasure to introduce the newest members of the Federal Way Police Department to you and our residents. Mayor Farrell will administer the oath of office this evening. The five officers standing before you are entry level and experienced lateral police officers currently in our field training program. These officers are quality individuals and people of integrity. We are fortunate to have them as part of our team and serving our community. First, we have Officer Justin McKee, Prior to joining the City of Federal Way, Justin served in, the, served in the United States Marine Corps for four and a half years and was honorably discharged in 2020. Justin started with the City on August 1st, 2023 and graduated from the Police Academy on January 23rd. Justin has an associate degree from Bellevue College. Justin enjoys playing golf, rock climbing in his spare time. Next, we have Officer Ella Shalegal. Ella is an experienced lateral police officer starting with the City of Federal Way on February 16th. Before joining the city, Ella was a deputy for the King County Sheriff's Office for three years. Her duties include, included working as a patrol deputy and a media relations officer. Prior to that, Ella was a call receiver for the Valley Communications Center. Ella enjoys outdoor camping, hiking, and running. She also enjoys various art forms, such as painting, sculpting, and spending time with her fiance and two dogs. Okay, next we have Officer Tiffany Parker. Tiffany is an experienced lateral police officer starting with the city on February 20th. Before joining the city of Federal Way, Tiffany was a detective assigned to the Special Victims Unit for the Unified Police Department, that's Salt Lake City, and as a task force officer for the FBI Child Exploitation Task Force. Tiffany earned a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice from Utah Valley University. Tiffany enjoys hiking with her dogs, cooking, and reading in her spare time. Next, we have Officer Victor Rodriguez. Victor started with the city on February 1st of last year and graduated from the police academy on February 27th. Before joining the city of Federal Way, Victor served as a squad leader for the United States Army. He was honorably discharged after five years of service and continues, to ser continues serving in the Army National Guard. Victor is married, enjoys hiking with their two dogs, spending time outdoors, and working on cars in his spare time. Next, we have Officer Alla Tulinkin. Alla started with the city on February 1st last year and graduated from the Police Academy on February 27th. Prior to joining the City of Federal Way, Allah's work history included employment with Express Employment Professionals and Boise, Cascade, Vancouver. Allah was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, grew up in Vancouver, Washington, where he played football throughout high school. Allah is married with a two-year-old daughter, and in his spare time, he enjoys lifting weights, spending quality time with his family by traveling and planning nights out. Please join me in welcoming the newest members of the Federal Way Police Department. <laughs> Officers, if you could come over to the podium, face, face the mayor, he'll give you the oath of office. Thank you, Chief. 
Officers, please raise your right hand, speak after me. I, please state your name. Do solemnly swear that I am a citizen of the United States. And the state of Washington. And that I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States. And the laws of the state of Washington. And will to the best of my judgment skill and ability, skill and ability. Truly, and faithfully. truly and faithfully, diligently and impartially, perform the duties of police officer in and for the city of Federal Way, County of King, State of Washington, as such duties prescribed by law. Congratulations. Police family, this is your time to exit. You do not have to sit through the entire council meeting. Please give them a tour of the PD. Oh, where? Congratulations, officers and your family members. Now we've got lots of seats. Come on up, everybody. I know we've got a lot of people in the back. We've got about uh, three rows here. Mayor David would like a, to get a photo of the officers. Oh yeah. yeah. Should we do it in, in front here? Okay. Yep. Okay. Are we staying we're staying up here? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Well I just need my little stool then. Okay. My high heels. All right, bring it in everybody. Wait, wait, I'm not ready. <laughs> Congratulations. Stay safe. Thank you. Great to see so many new officers and their families. Thank you again. Uh, and we still actually have some seats here in the front if anybody would like to uh, come forward. Um, okay, uh, now uh, we have a, uh, we've got a presentation of, of the Representative Roger Freeman Award uh, to Rosamond Pratt. I just want to say that uh, Representative Freeman, uh, Roger, was a dear friend of mine. I knew him for years. We had cases together when I was, uh, when I was uh, working in the legal field. And he was just a true gentleman, and we miss him every day. So I just I wanted to say that. We, so I'll, I'll turn it over. Saudia uh, Abdullah, um, the uh, chair of the Diversity Commission, I will turn it over to you now. Absolutely. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Saudia J. Abdullah, and I have the pleasure of being the Diversity Commission's chair here in Federal Way. Today we're here to present to you the winner of the Representative Roger Freeman Scholarship Award. As a state representative, he proudly served this community. He believed in justice, advocating for those that lacked the means to help themselves. He supported diversity, the inclusion of all. He touted compassion, which includes humility and volunteerism, integrity, including honesty and reliability. After a competitive contest, the Diversity Commission selected a winner. Join me in congratulating Miss Roseman Pratt, a 12th grader at Decatur High School. Her essay embodied the principles and concepts of Roger Freeman. If you, if you would like a copy of her essay, it is in the back of the room. Miss Pratt. Let's go this way.
Good job, Mrs. Pratt. All right. Um, oh, uh, I, we have on the calendar, we, uh, uh, we struck it, the uh, Financial Literacy Month is next month. And so we'll, uh, we'll do that. It'll be the April 2nd meeting, our next city council meeting, just FYI. Um, all right, Mayor's Emerging Issues and Report. Uh, is Bill around? There we go. Okay. We're moving through the agenda, everybody. It's great to see so many people here. Thank you for coming tonight. It's a beautiful day. All right, uh, this is Bill Vedino. He does uh, uh, all kinds of issues at constituent outreach. So uh, the council, actually uh, many members of the council, they uh, were at the uh, National League of Cities in Washington, D.C. Uh, March 11th, last week, March 11th through the 13th. And we also, while we were there, we did some federal lobbying as well. So uh, we had the opportunity, uh, the uh, upper left picture uh, shows uh, Councilmember McDaniel, uh, myself, uh, Councilmember Lydia Sefa Dawson, our, uh, our economic development director, uh, Tonya Carter, and Councilmember Hong Tran. Uh, we had to be careful. One, two. We had to be careful never to uh, uh, have more than four members at any particular meeting or discussion because we can't. Once you've got four members, uh, that equals a majority, and we can't do um, a business. Uh, you know, once once a majority gathers and a quorum is present. Uh, that's not appropriate to do that without appropriate notice. Now, we did note that we were going to be back there, and, and we noted that, but we tried when we were meeting with our legislators, and, and we were successful doing so, uh, to always make sure that we guarded that uh, to comply with law. Um, you see the middle there. We did get an opportunity to go see uh, uh, Abe uh, and uh, Honest Abe, and then we, uh, we actually, do you see that picture that I'm signing right there? Uh, it's a, a picture of the a, a hand drawing of the Capitol. Tanya Carter, economic development director, her father is a longtime architect uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. In fact, many of the buildings uh, uh, nearby, uh, close in Virginia, uh, were uh, designed by her father and around the world, frankly. And so her father hand drew um, uh, pictures of the United States Capitol that all of the council signed. That's me signing uh, at the bottom. Um, and uh, we presented that not only to our uh, uh, representative Adam Smith, uh, who was uh, there in our meeting, but also to our two United States senators. And we went, uh, we had the opportunity uh, to uh, speak with our senators, uh, with the entire Washington State delegation. And the next day, we followed up uh, with meetings in our in the uh, the senators' offices with their senior staff. Uh, there, you see uh, that the president did address uh, the uh, NLC. Uh, uh, body. Uh, that's the picture on the bottom left. There were probably about maybe, there had to be over 3,000, 3,500 uh, people in this ballroom. Um, and you had to get there very early because there was Secret Service and there was all the, all the things. And it was, it was great uh, to, uh, to see our president. And there you could see we were getting ready. Uh, or I think I, we took that picture when it was done, uh, right there in the middle bottom. And uh, we had a great trip. We learned a lot. I uh, heard from some uh, cabinet secretaries, obviously we heard from the president, and uh, really about uh, governance um, uh, from other cities. Uh, nearly, uh, well, clearly every state in the nation was represented, and we met people from all over the country. So this is something that the National League of Cities uh, was, um, uh, you know, is, is very important for us to uh, hear best practices on all of the issues uh, that we're working with. Um, we also um, had the opportunity <clears throat> the day that we met with our U.S. Senators uh, staff and went to their offices, the former Sarge, our, our uh, federal lobbyist is an individual named Rick Agnew. Uh, uh, Rick has uh, been our lobbyist for the past few years. Uh, he uh, lived in Federal Way for decades and raised his family here. Uh, he and his wife uh, uh, lived in Federal Way. And uh, in the law firm that he represents, and this was actually something very special, the law firm that he represents hires an individual. I don't know if anybody's ever heard the motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar. Very, very well known, very famous. Well, Zig had a brother named Jim, and Jim went to Washington. And he went to Washington in 1964. And uh, that individual, and he started working in the Senate then, he rose to become the Sergeant of Arms of the United States Senate. Uh, he was uh, for, I believe, two full years. He was actually the last. Immigration and Naturalization Services uh, Commissioner. He was head of the uh, the INS before it rolled into Homeland Security, um, and um, uh, just a true gentleman. Uh, he gave us a tour of of the entire Capitol um, and specifically the Senate, where he still had floor privileges. So this council and I 
I got to walk on the, on the floor of the United States Senate and then went and had lunch uh, where there were a few uh, lunching senators as well. It was really a tremendous uh, opportunity and, and uh, he, he worked with all those. If you can imagine the United States senators from 1964 forward, um, I, I, it, was, it was a great conversation. Uh, and he worked over, he worked all over Washington. He has actually, uh, uh, he was Deputy Secretary of the Interior under President Reagan. So it was a tremendous opportunity to meet somebody so well connected and, and uh, uh, to see, um, uh, you know, some of those things and also to uh, connect up uh, with, the, uh, with the Senate. And Rick Agnew was very helpful. Um, I'm just going to say, <clears throat> for those of you who are teachers, if you look at the top of the um, Congress, um, very tippy top, you can barely see it. It looks like a little black figure. That's an, what, what you want to teach your children is the principles and values that this nation was built upon. And there's hidden meanings all over our nation's capital. And that particular, at the top of that, is an Indian maiden. And it's actually a mythological uh, person uh, that was uh, somebody who was um, uh, revered by um, the uh, American Indians who settled in that Washington, D.C. area. But if you look at that, that statue is called Freedom. And if you Google that, <clears throat> you will see a whole um, uh, mythological reasoning behind uh, why she actually has an, a feather, an uh, eagle feather on her head that m makes her turn into an eagle that flies away. But it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, topic for you to explain to you if your teachers and your children to explain one of the values that our nation is built. We're built on value of freedom. Thank you, uh, Council President. Okay, uh, then um, let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, the week before, we were um, we had a, uh, a town hall meeting, our neighborhood connection meeting, uh, where uh, senior staff, the directors, and some um, uh, you know folks in, in the different departments uh, went to um, an elementary school um, uh, right in Twin Lakes, uh, Olympic View Elementary School, the brand new Olympic View Elementary. Um, in fact, our city clerk, um, uh, Stephanie, attended. Um, uh, 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 Olympic View Elementary. This is the brand new one. We had a good crowd. Uh, we were there probably about two and a half hours. Uh, and now we just approved today the, we, we condensed that down to about an hour. And it's going to go on Channel 21 and it's on YouTube as well. So even if you didn't get a chance to go to that, you can watch. Uh, in fact, actually, if you go to my mayor's Facebook page, you can just click and it's on YouTube. Uh, that you could find it there and all the questions and answers and, and the staff presentations. So uh, it was a good meeting and uh, hopefully we're going to have more. You know, obviously uh, we will have more. Uh, the, uh, obviously we've been, at, we're f uh, four years since the pandemic began and I think it's, you know, four and a half years since we had an in-person meeting like this because of COVID. So uh, it's, uh, this is the first of many to come. All right. Last Friday, right after we got back, some of uh, some of the folks uh, on the on the dais uh, got back a little late, and so they still managed to get there for the raising of the St. Patrick's Day flag. Uh, we had a, a great opportunity to. Uh, uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you very much to uh, everybody involved in that. Uh, the, the Patricks uh, did a great job, uh, Craig and and his entire family. Uh, we uh, uh, we had some bagpipe players and drummers, and and I just want to thank um, uh, all those folks. Uh, uh, Craig, thank you very much. Uh, for uh, making that happen, and, and uh, again, it was a family affair with the whole family, and so it was a it was a nice morning, and that was again uh, the Friday before it was last Friday before St. Patty's Day. Okay, and the flag is uh, is out there till uh, end of the week. <clears throat> then, uh, right before that, actually, and, and Council Member uh, Honda, thank you very much. We because we had the uh, St. Patrick's Day, we were concerned that it would impinge on the uh, communities and schools breakfast, uh, but we just pushed the Patrick, St. Patrick's Day about 15, 20 minutes, and we uh, were able to make uh, the communities and schools breakfast right over at the community center. Uh, and great presentation, great uh, organization. It was great to hear from the young people involved and the teachers and the, and the people involved in communities and schools. They, they do a very, very important job um, uh, helping our students. All right, next, uh, these are uh, uh, upcoming events. We've got the Korean Quarterly Meeting uh, this Thursday, 6.30 p.m. right here. Uh, that's an ongoing, I think it's been going on for at least 26 years now. Um, that's the, uh, we've got the diaper drive this Saturday, March 23rd, uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Twin Lakes Fred Meyer. Um, and 
Uh, and actually, if you go back, I just want to give everybody a heads up. We've all heard about concerns in the Fred Meyer parking lot, and at that town hall meeting, I promised one of the uh, uh, one of the folks there uh, that we would that I would call Fred Meyer the very next day. That's what I did. And uh, to, uh, yesterday, we met with the general manager of Fred Meyer um, and another individual, I think the assistant store manager, along with the chief and the deputy chief and a commander, uh, to make sure that we are working hand in hand uh, to make sure that Twin Lakes. Uh, uh, Fred Meyer and the entire area there is safe for people to shop um, and that we've, we've got uh, open lines of communication and our special operations team is going to be working. So, uh, But this Saturday at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. we'll be collecting uh, uh, diapers. Uh, is Cheryl here? Cheryl, you want to get up and talk about the diaper drive? You were in the paper. I saw you, I saw you in the Federal Mirror. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Tell us about the diaper drive. Um, so it's called the March of Diapers. This is the 10th year. We're helping out uh, 17 nonprofits, uh, five of them directly here in Federal Way. Um, the other nonprofits actually help uh, anybody from any city. We are looking forward to literally uh, breaking last year's record in from 10 to 2. It was a little over 11,000 diapers. Uh, we'll have people stationed at each one of the doors if you would like to come volunteer, um, we, just quick expl explanation like, you know, here's who we give to, what we do. And you'd be surprised how many awesome people there is in this town. I mean, I've, lots of young single guys came out with a great big, huge cart, six or seven boxes, diapers, made us cry. Um, they just said, you know, we get it. We don't have kids yet, but they took a light, look, look at the price of diapers and um, they're not covered under an EBT card. You can buy food, pop, energy drinks, but you can't buy diapers with an EBT card. So if you want to volunteer, uh, get with me. I'm over there at the break, or you can call. Uh, everybody has my phone number around here. You can ask anybody. Otherwise, uh, show up at 10 o'clock or show up at noon, and we'll put you to work. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much, Cheryl. <laughs> And I want to let everybody know our own state representative, Christine Reeves, is present in the room. Thank you, representative. You know, it was a short session, but the problem with short sessions is they still cram a whole bunch into it. So thank you so much. I know it was a lot of hard work, very grueling. And thank you so much for, for representing Federal Way in that, that important legislative session. Um, okay. And um, I think, uh, oh, and then I almost forgot, uh, we've got the Federal Way Lions uh, this coming Saturday, the 23rd, 70 years of service. Uh, it's over at the Golden Spoon at 5 p.m., um, and I think you could buy your ticket uh, ahead of time. And uh, uh, they have just done tremendous uh, work. Is Bob here? He normally comes to these meetings. Um, so uh, that's at the Golden Spoon right on 320th. It used to be called the, what it used to be called? What's that? Where the, uh, the Golden yeah, the Golden Crop, they're, they're, that's it, that's right. Okay, so that's where it's at, Golden Spoon, 5 p.m. this Saturday. Um, and then you know what's not on there is uh, 8 a.m. Uh, on Saturday. Don't we have the, um, oh gosh, what's, it's over at the, uh, um, hold on, hold on. Got to go to my calendar here. Um, that's it, it's not on here. It's Young Life, a camp fundraiser at Jimmy Max. Uh, from 8 to 10 a.m. So those are the things. So you've got the uh, Jimmy Max fundraiser at Jimmy Max uh, breakfast, uh, and then you've got the diaper drive, and then we've got dinner at 5. So it's going to be a busy Saturday. Okay, uh, with that, uh, that kind of concludes uh, my report now. Um, but concluding, uh, we've got more importantly, um, the health through housing update. Well, at the King County Urban League, we've got Kelly Ryder, King County Interim Director, Department of Community and Human Services. Mario Williams Sweet, King County Major Initiatives Manager, Health Through Housing. Uh, Kiana uh, Taiska, Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, Director of Housing. Drew Zimmerman, King County Facilities Management Division. Um, and uh, with that, um, we've got Sarah Bridgeford, our Human Services Manager. Sarah, you want to do a, a brief explanation or just kick it over to them?
Uh, I will pass it off, but you do have the, the team from King County and the Urban League who are uh, facilitating uh, this process and will be implementing healthier housing. Uh, they're going to be able to speak to it better than I will and have uh, some slides prepared, and I think that that's where we will start. All right. Kelly, does it make sense to start with you? Okay, very good. One of us is one of us has thought this through. Oh, it looks a little bit different tonight than it has in the past. Uh, so just bear with me, and I'm sure it is user error. Yes. Okay. All right. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, I will just do a quick introduction. Kelly Ryder, Acting Director for the County Department of Community and Human Services. Good to be with you all this evening to give an update on our health through housing property that we've got here in Federal Way and that we are continuing to work to open. Uh, we're excited to introduce you to the operator for our site here, the Urban League, and give a chance for folks to ask questions and be able to make sure that we are engaging with the Federal Way community in the way that the City Council would like to see to make sure that we can all have a successful opening both for the residents and the neighbors around uh, the building and so with that I will turn it over to Mario Williams sweet the director of our health through housing program thank you um, good evening council members uh, federal way residents my name is Mario Williams sweet and as the director of the health through housing initiative I'm here today to talk about the strides we've made as well as the path that we're forging in order to address homelessness um, we are committed to creating safe, stable, supportive housing and understand the importance of accountability and transparency within our work. So I'm here today not to just talk about our plans, but also really the things that we've done and uh, our commitment to ensuring real and measurable change through the Health Through Housing Initiative. I don't know how to change this. So. Uh, the PowerPoint? There we go. Oh, okay. Um, so health through housing uh, really uh, represents a bold step forward in our collective you know, action to, to address homelessness. Uh, leveraging a sales tax initiated in 2020, we've embarked on a journey to, uh, uh, excuse me, we embarked on a journey to purchase properties and transform them into permanent supportive housing units. Our goal is ambitious yet achievable, um, provide 1,600 units of of housing to our chronically homeless neighbors, thereby reducing the racial and ethnic disproportionality evident within our current homelessness crisis. Thus far, we've acquired 11 sites, uh, 15 total sites th throughout King County within the Health Through Housing portfolio, and just under 1,400 units of housing. Who we serve. Um, Imagine the impact of being chronically homelessness, or chronic homelessness has on someone's life. Uh, the average age of our residents is are 50 years old. They're not only challenged with facing, you know, how to afford affordable housing, uh, but also managing physical and or behavioral health disabilities. Uh, and these aren't statistics. These are real people in our community um, who need stability and support. And when we talk about chronic homelessness, we're referring to veterans who've served our country seniors who contributed to our society for decades, and individuals who, through no fault of their own, find themselves uh, without a home. Our initiative really offers dignity, support, and services uh, to really ensure that they can continue their recovery journey. Um, the intersection of health through housing, uh, we, we focus on supporting individuals at the intersection of, of chronic homelessness, um, folks who earn at or below 30% of the average median income, and really through our local and referral uh, local and regional referral process, we ensure that our approach isn't just inclusive, but it's impactful. Up to 65% of our units are designated to local referral. And that's via city coordination and local services agencies. Local prioritization. Um, like we've done in other cities throughout the county, uh, our strategy is deeply rooted in local prioritization and engagement. Um, we do this by collaborating with city officials and local uh, you know, community organizations to ensure that our efforts align with uh, the, the needs of the local community. Collaboration is also at the heart of everything we do, and you see it in partnerships with agencies like Catholic Community Services and other partners, um, where we really showcase 
that we don't only just build community, but we build support systems. And you know, we've seen firsthand that collaboration really leads to tangible results. Why else really is local uh, you know, prioritization important? Let's, let's grasp you know, really the, 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 uh, the magnitude. In June of 2022, South King County reported 2,185 individuals as being homeless. Of those, 525 are connected right here to Federal Way. Let's dig deeper into those numbers. 33% of those folks, which is roughly 175 individuals, meet the definition of chronic homelessness. The site that we acquired in Federal Way has 100 units and will serve upwards of 85 individuals. Community engagement and collaboration. Um, our commitment to Federal Way is really mirrored in our comprehensive community engagement efforts. Uh, public presentations like this one tonight, uh, tours of our site with uh, local leaders, you know, we're committed to ongoing and transparent dialogue. Our future plans include uh, operator meet and greets with community as well as extensive outreach. Um, this slide really represents, you know, our promise to continuing that partnership through every really step of the way. Our journey thus far has been marked with significant milestones including uh, the submission of really uh, uh, critical applications, as well as bi-monthly meetings with our uh, city partners. And I think it's a testament of our proactive approach and really our commitment here. Um, the compliance, uh, in compliance, excuse me, with the city's re uh, code requirements, uh, Urban League has submitted their PSH application license. Uh, within that is the operational agreement, the code of conduct for, for residents, the community engagement and relations plan, and our safety and security plan. Um, plans that really showcase a priority, the well-being and safety of both our residents and the surrounding community. With secured measures, like with like managed access gates at this facility, we're not only looking to keep people safe, but we also want to foster an environment where people feel supported and secure. Uh, Health through housing plans on partnering with local police, fire, uh, emergency uh, management you know, departments um, to really shape protocols and other emergency management planning. We believe in direct and clear communication with community. Um, that's why we really stand on the principle of having an open line of communication 24-7 with staffing, as well as hosting ongoing community events to listen to the community and uh, respond to their concerns to ensure that our operations uh, are really effective for the entire neighborhood. Um, we uh, look at that as part of really the development of what we call our good neighbor agreement, which you'll see here, which is another you know, document that really solidifies our commitment to being a responsible and positive community member. Our success in Auburn really also highlights, I think, our uh, you know, efforts in, in, in what we look at as far as success, and we look to replicate that here in, in Federal Way. Working closely with city partners and local organizations, you know, we've seen positive outcomes thus far. Um, and again, we look to replicate that here in Federal Way, but also paying attention to the unique characteristics of this community. Uh, one of the most, uh, you know, indicators of success, really, for health through housing is, is retention. Um, and a remarkable 95% of folks who have found homes through health through housing remain housed a year later. This is the foundation of like rebuilding lives. We also, uh, you know, really ensure evidence-based practices throughout all of our operations at health through housing. And this, you know, really ensures that our supports are not just theoretical, but they're grounded in evidence-based practices that really are effective for individuals and are sustainable. Um, my next slide, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, our partners, uh, Urban League. And I just wanna mention that it's really crucial to recognize, I think, the comprehensive uh, approach to supports, um, not limited to serving really just one demographic, but that they really do work with some of our, of our most vulnerable populations. And so uh, I'd like to share, uh, I'd like to, uh, to share more, excuse me, I'd like to introduce our Urban League team. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kiana Tayeski. I'm the Housing Director of Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Fuzi Bilal. I am the uh, Special Project Consultant for the Urban League. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to, to share some of our work. We are uh, Urban League. We are um, 
we take a holistic approach to uh, serving the most vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable communities that we work with. And uh, you see some of our programs um, that are uh, that we offer. We are uh, uh, we we do workforce development, public health, education, housing is a big part of that. And this initiative falls under our housing um, with all the wraparound supports that you see uh, on uh, on the screen. We are very we we're committed to providing. Um, all the resources needed for our clients and, and the residents are uh, at the facility and we're there to, to support them in, um, uh, in, in their journey and, and navigate um, how to get them back towards their recovery. So that's our, our goal. Um, want to share. Kiana will share some of our uh, experience in this, uh, in, uh, in this work uh, through her team as well. Okay, I have a team, an outreach team that has experience, that has been experienced with going out into the encampments um, facing um, participants one on one, meeting them where they're w meeting them where they are, um, supplying s hygiene kits. They go out there and support them as far as wanting them to be housed or helping them be housed. Um, a lot of them have been housed permanent supportive housing shelters. Um, we've had experience with um, basically getting starting a program straight off out of an encampment we had a six-month program it lasted six months there were 68 individuals that came straight from the encampment and it took us two weeks to get everybody settled in um, we had nursing um, behavioral health navigators we had uh, case management every day and every day they were able to be moved some people were able to move forward so this is something that we are experiencing um, and we take, we meet a person where they are. We meet them like it, they could have just became homeless and because of, of losing a job, uh, having an injury, anything that um, everybody is not the same. So there's some people that have been out there for years and then there's some people that are just recently out there and it's not normal for everybody but like me and you, we can lose our job and can be in that same position. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's how I feel. Um, that's what our program is about. Uh, uh, Kiana is our, our housing director and she's really passionate about uh, <laughs> the work that she does and she, she manages a team that's hands on with uh, uh, um, working with uh, our population. Uh, really important for us is uh, to uh, uh, build support around our housing and communication plan that's, uh, that allows us to share what's going on around our facility, the support that we're providing. And as uh, Mario mentioned, uh, in, in our, um, uh, we've, we've submitted f uh, five extensive documents. The operation plan has been looked at uh, uh, through, uh, the, uh, through our partners and, and helped us kind of put all the experience that we have as an organization that deals with the homelessness from a holistic perspective uh, and also um, providing um, a, uh, a place where, where uh, it integrates the entire community. So we're, we're excited about that. We have, a, um, as we mentioned, a code of conduct that's very specific to, uh, uh, to the, the population and how we can navigate any uh, concerns around uh, behaviors or, or any of that. We have a, um, a criminal record or an expungement pro program that we're, a uh, support program that we're, provide, we're hoping to provide for our residents as well to help them uh, in that space and uh, um, insurance uh, and uh, health care uh, um, and our health, public health team is there. Uh, each person at the facility will receive a uh, case manager that they work with uh, uh, during their uh, stay with us as well. So, and we're happy to take any questions. Uh. Very good. And what I want to let everybody know is what, what we're going to do is we're going to have, council will ask uh, direct questions right now. And then um, I understand that members of the public here may have individual questions. So the most important thing we do, and I'll say that in a few minutes, is hear from you. We'll do that during public comment. What we'll do after, uh, we'll, we'll take note of the questions that are asked then, and then we'll have them retake the podium to address some of the questions. Well, right now the council will ask some questions, uh, and then uh, we'll hear uh, from the public. With that, Council President. Uh, well, if I may, I'm so sorry. You are, of course, welcome to decide how you'd like to move forward. We do have, I think, two more slides in our oh. presentation, and so it's totally up to you oh, whether no. you'd like to do questions now or not. Kelly, I'm sorry. I, we, no, we totally do <coughs> questions. Let's do questions. that. So however you'd like to proceed. I got ahead of myself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. 
Sorry about that, appreciate it. This last slide for me is really just uh, to show the progress to date in our municipal coordination with dates of submission uh, for our land use application, our building construction permit, and our, the PSH license that we just talked about with the, the, the documents that were developed to kind of uh, to accompany um, that license. Um, in conclusion, I just you know, want to say that I think this journey that we're taking towards addressing chronic homelessness is ongoing. Um, we really, I think, look at this as an opportunity to continue uh, and understand, I think, and recognize the importance of dialogue, understanding, and collaboration uh, to, in this effort. And so this presentation is really an invitation to keep those conversations going. Um, and so I look forward to working with the stakeholders, including the council, um, and, and as we navigate. So thank you for your consideration. Uh, appreciate it. Our last slide will be... Uh, from uh, Drew Zimmerman, our Deputy Director of our Facilities Management Division, uh, to talk about some other King County projects. Thank you, Mario. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give some updates for you all on the Federal Way Red Lion location, uh, which we know is uh, also very important to the community. Um, our uh, if you've been around the site over the past couple weeks, uh, you've probably noticed a little bit more activity on our front, and uh, we are pleased to uh, update you that we have engaged with uh, KMB Architects and have identified funding for this project uh, and intend to uh, move forward at a fairly aggressive pace, uh, but we hope to, that, that it's also a very attainable uh, pace as well to get this site open. Uh, by uh, winter 2024, so um, just a, a few months away. Uh, where we're at right now is um, continuing to uh, work with the uh, architect that we brought on board to prepare drawings. Uh, that will also <coughs> help uh, us submit the use process three application to the city of Federal Way, uh, which we will need to do for the site. Um, we uh, intend to address a number of, of items at the site, which uh, includes repairing uh, water damaged uh, areas of the building, uh, installing PTEC units, uh, and then some minor tenant improvements on the first floor uh, that will be um, supportive for our operator that has been selected for the site to uh, manage the program uh, there. Uh, the work that's happening right now is uh, working with a number of consultants to put the scope of the, the work together. Um, we anticipate having that completed uh, in just a few weeks by the end of April. Uh, and in May is when we intend to submit the, the use process three application to the city of Federal Way, as well as uh, begin our procurement process to identify a contractor to complete uh, the work at the, the hotel. Um, we are anticipating construction to begin in August uh, and then again hoping for the substantial completion and occupancy by winter um, winter months so thank you drew thank you very much thank you very much for that update uh, would there be an opportunity to either uh, drew or uh, Kelly maybe you would could be better to uh, either of you to explain the difference between individuals that would go to Red Lion versus the health through housing and what you know what where on the continuum um, you know folks are and you know uh, what the purpose of one is versus the other absolutely I'm happy to take that mr. mayor uh, so our health through housing initiative as Mario described is our initiative to provide permanent supportive housing to folks across King County who have been experiencing long-term episodes of homelessness uh, as we engaged in our partnership with the city of federal way uh, we understood that having a shelter here to be able to serve local South King County and Federal Way residents was of paramount importance. And so in the acquisition of the former Red, mm, excuse me, too many buildings, uh, the former Red Lion, uh, we have uh, created an opportunity to short term create shelter that can immediately bring folks inside regardless of their homelessness status. And so our hope is to be able to build on the existing day center uh, opportunity and other services that Federal Way has made available to make quick access to bring folks inside and connect them to the broader housing assistance and other uh, services that may be necessary to get to housing stability. And that's, you know, emergent, uh, you know, like cold weather, that kind of thing, uh, to get people literally out of a dangerous situation. That's right. Uh, 
we do not intend for the shelter at this time to be time limited. Uh, for a long time, the you know, homelessness uh, service providers have been working through how to make sure that they can best connect with folks. Uh, and so our hope will be to serve folks for as long as they need in order to be able to access the affordable housing options and care and services that they need so that they can uh, live productive lives. And uh, Kelly, uh, capacity again at Red Line once it gets operational, our ballpark. How many rooms? I was thinking somewhere around 80 to 100, yeah. um, but we can absolutely follow up and get you a more precise number. I, I, that ballpark is helpful. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, so I think we've got some questions. Uh, thank you very much. I know I got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, let's start with Council President uh, Coach Mark. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so I'm going to just bring up some issues that are we have some people in the audience that are wonderful people from our community on both sides of the coin who believe that we need to have help for our citizens and and uh, who others who want to have help for our citizens but want to see that with treatment so so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw out some topics and let everybody else ask the questions so some of the topics that I think we're going to be asking about tonight what is your success rate with, with whomever uh, you've dealt with in other, uh, with the Urban League in other um, health or housing? What is your, I'm, not, I'm just bringing out some topics that'll be asked. Um, who will be the residents? How many from Federal Way will be the residents? That's gonna be another question. You don't have to answer, I'm just gonna throw that out because other people will ask that. We have concerns over drug use. We know that that's legal when you're in the facility, not legal to be uh, in public, but concerned about purchasing drugs outside the facility, um, how that will be um, dealt with. I'm wondering what your wraparound services are. Uh, and then um, my question, you know, we're very concerned about fentanyl being opioid use with fentanyl in almost everything now, even in marijuana. So we're, we know how addictive that is and how people, in order to get off that addiction, you know, you're going to need treatment. But my question really be, is, can you describe uh, health through housing in one of your other hotels, how this is working? Pick any city, whether it's Renton or wherever. Yeah. So as we kind of spoke to a little bit, Auburn is a really good example. It's in South King County. Um, that site uh, has... Uh, really a cool, unique feature where we were able to bring people in uh, really quickly under our emergency housing, which is, uh, you know, really the same level of services as permanent supportive housing, but really focused uh, on our ability to really kind of bring folks in quickly and uh, doesn't necessarily have the same requirements as PSH. But that site was able to bring folks in last year, early, uh, excuse me, late 2022, and has continued to ramp up uh, utilization. We had... Um, uh, 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 construction going on at certain wings of that site in order to actually really uh, really maximize I think the usage of that site and be able to bring folks in during cold months but then really work to, to do the rehabilitation in order to get the, 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 the full certificate of occupancy um, since that time we've been continuing to ramp up utilization uh, we've worked in partnership with local police and fire at that site in order to really, I think, ensure safety of the grounds and if it, you know, folks as far as uh, trespassing. Um, we worked with the, with the operator, Compass Housing, and the business community. We have ongoing uh, uh, community meetings like I talked about every month uh, to really talk about, again, the community concerns and to be able to respond to those concerns. Um, have a really good neighbor agreement that we've crafted with the city and the operators in collaboration so we really stood together and, and rose that up. Um, and we've seen a lot of success in that site as far as residents who actually are working in that local community and businesses that we've brought to the table to be partners and have really, I think, uh, been open and, 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 and great, I think, partners within the community of seeing, I think, uh, you know, opportunities for folks who are now housed and can, you know, get surgeries and recover in certain spaces. There's a lot going on, I think, within all of our sites. Auburn is a really good example because we did really a, uh, an intentional ramp up where now we have the full certificate of occupancy and we're gonna almost be at full utilization here very soon. But it's been a really, really cool process of collaboration and uh, working with not only the residents, but the business community um, and really the city uh, to really help to, 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 to build, I think, agreements that we all felt really, really good about. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Um, 
Uh, let's uh, let's see here. Let's actually just start at this end and, and work our way. So, Councilmember McDaniel, Councilmember Honda, Councilmember Walsh, and then Councilmember Dovey. Uh, Councilmember McDaniel. Thank you. Uh, I got a couple questions. Uh, the first one is I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Um, the health health for health health through housing is the one who will actually be owns the property, and then it's going to be managed by the Urban League. Is that the correct understanding? Who makes decisions on who goes in and who doesn't? Who's who makes that final decision for? who becomes residents and who does not yes so it's a it's a collaboration uh we bring all of the local kind of human services agencies together for what we call a referral kind of ramp up period where then the referrals for folks who meet eligibility for health through housing which is chronic homelessness that by definition is a length of homelessness for a year or more in the combination of having a physical or behavioral health disability and meeting that 30 percent or below area medium income and so those referrals come directly to King County. We make sure that, that folks actually meet those eligibility requirements before then moving those referrals to the Urban League. The Urban League is brought on to really uh, do that engagement, make sure that they really continue to work with uh, that, partic that participant. Um, and you know the suitability screening and the reason that, that we've contracted with our operators is because they have 40, 50 years of really working with uh, folks who you know, are within this population and can then make a really, I think, good assessment on if this person will be successful at this level of care. So it's a combination of <laughs> King County really kind of helping with el early eligibility and then Urban League really kind of doing that last engagement and suitability screening in order to ultimately enroll folks. So pretty much you provide a list, they select from the list the ones we, we, that fit the we, most. The list comes from community agencies that we bring together to really define, I think, uh, what that local network is going to look like. And so that, we're, we're working in collaboration with the city on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, my next question is going to be, you mentioned that majority of them are 15 years and older. Do you assume that majority of our residents in this facility are going to be 50 years and older? We do. Um, in addition to the age being, our average age being 50, um, we know that folks who have been living on the street age about 10 years long, uh, more than what their actual age is. And so you see like health care, you know, uh, issues with, within the populations that are really kind of expedited because of folks who've lived outside for a long time. So we do, uh, you know, look at, I think, uh, what our current average age is and, and, you know, think that that data will remain true. Okay. Um, one of the other questions was, is you had mentioned 65 would be local residents. The slide had 35 to 65. Have we solidified on what the number will be for federal yet? Yeah, it's up to 65%. So we, 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 we look to really get uh, the first 35% uh, uh, to local first, followed by 35% to the regional, so that's 70%. That final 30% goes to local first. And so we really, really work you know, with the local process to ensure that we can make you know, those local referrals happen. What we want to ensure also, though, is that we don't have vacancies. And so after, you know, three-month windows usually around the, the threshold, we then will go back to the regional process to fill vacancies if needed. We've not needed to do that in any of our sites, but that's why you see the sliding scale from 35 to 65. We really, really push to get that 65% of local referral, though, and we've been able to accomplish that in all of our other cities. Okay, so we start at 35, but the goal is 65 for local? It's, yeah, 65%. Gotcha. And could you define what local residence is? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's still actually being defined with our with our partnership right now. I, we we want to you know work with you all to really define I think what that local catchment area is going to look like and how big uh, we feel that that local uh, you know preference really needs to be. Okay, um, the mention was there's 100 units and there's 85 individuals. Mr. Yeah. McDaniel, I think Sarah's got something to, to pop in on oh, that okay. particular question. Go for it. Uh, so. If I may, uh, just some of what that process will look like now that uh, this building is moving forward, they're coming in with that land use process, is we'll start talking about what local re referral will look like for the City of Federal Way. There are a couple different approaches. Uh, when we talk about homelessness, the definition of residency is um, uh, nuanced. Uh, often it's where did you sleep last night sometimes you know it's other types of connections to the community so some of those will be conversations that we'll have uh, with <coughs> Mayor Farrell and City Council to start uh, community as well and that will be a process that we've talked about and we'll be uh, working through pretty quickly um, additionally the same is true with referrals uh, we, we do within the city have our police department parks and um, just as two of the examples we have a lot of engagement with folks who are on un unhoused social service agencies so we'll be working with them as well um, in in the coming months to um, work on that local referral all right thank you that's where we came all right thank you um, like uh, the next one was going to be the units versus individuals um, is 
Uh, just a few, can you elaborate on why it has 100 units but 85 individuals instead of just 85 units? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the site is an extended stay and it does not come already with community spaces. And so in order for programming, we do have to build out community spaces and staff offices. And so uh, we estimate that we will have up to upwards of 85 units for individuals to be housed okay. uh, based off of you know, being able to create those programming spaces. Gotcha. Um, my next set of uh, questions are actually for Urban League. Um, one of my questions is going to be, you did mention that you guys will be having some wraparound services. Will those services be offered on site or just connecting with um, uh, other groups and stuff like that? No, these connections will be on site and they'll be with the case management and our behavioral health team will be on site. We'll have a health team on site as well. Okay. Um, and then if there is any, um, one of the concerns we're gonna, we constantly hear from the citizens is if there's anything that pops up, any issues with the particular residents and stuff. I will assume that is underneath your guys' jurisdiction for when we, the problems do pop up then? Um, yes, absolutely. We, we have provided a, um, a feedback protocol and a way to contact us and with a timeline to get back to, uh, to, concern, to the concerns within a, a timeline to address that issue as well. So we, we will be the, the main point of contact for any uh, uh, issues and we want to hear those because we want to get better and providing the best service we can you know and we want to engage our community and, and because uh, in this process as well gotcha um, I'm sure I just my other colleagues have other questions I want to finish up with the last question I have um, when we were at the uh, conference this last week uh, we talked about homeless and it was one of the biggest topics we talked to a bunch of people in different states uh, cities and everything and one of the things that blew my mind was foster children are the number one uh, for coming in. How does a foster child fall into this and how do we support them? Does this housing provide an opportunity for, uh, for foster children who are being aged out of the system? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, we do at King County support a broad range of programs uh, and as you identify the Health Through Housing Initiative is not one that we have identified to prioritize young people. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, in the early stages of the Health Through Housing Initiative when we were really focusing on getting available buildings as quick as possible at the lowest cost as possible, we quickly recognize that most of these units are not built for families um, and having larger families who are oftentimes the ones uh, most in need in these small units isn't really a great fit in a hotel. Uh, it's why we often rely on uh, Mary's Place and other programs that are able to support rapid rehousing to get families quickly rehoused in a housing model that fits for their family size and family needs. Um, in terms of foster care, I know that the state has been working really hard on figuring out how to support uh, foster care, particularly youth in transition and their housing needs. Uh, I can't speak tonight on exactly what the state has invested in, but it is our goal to kind of fit together the different pieces that different governments are investing in to make sure we're meeting all of the population's needs. Um, and we continue to work with our youth and young adult providers to make sure that we understand their best practices and how we can continue to adapt our funding to be able to meet that. All right, let me rephrase it. Could somebody who's aging out of foster care qualify for this service? If they were Today. homeless for a year or more and with a disability, then they could qualify but it is unlikely that at that age they would qualify for that extended period of time. Um, and so that's why I say like it's usually a matter of foster care um, and transitioning youth being able to use other programs. All right, all right thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Honda. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate that. So on the Red Lion, I am hoping that you'll be opening by next winter. We've gone several winters without um, without this building being open. So how many beds will be there again? I think they said 80, 85 to 100. 85 to 100? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's not for families. That's for single adults. Could it be for couples, though? That's correct. Okay. How long could someone stay there? We will be working on the program model, which will be part, as I understand it, of our application to the city as we begin operations. Um, but our expectation is that it would be non-time limited uh, and be able to serve folks as long as the model is working for them um, and as long as they are still engaging in services. And does someone just walk up to the door and say that they need housing? Yeah, the referral model I would really want to be able to work with our partners on. Um, as you may remember, uh, when we first acquired the building, we did apply uh, for Catholic Community Services to partner with us on that building. As you state, it has been a couple of years uh, in the transition here, and so uh, we'll be re-engaging with them here over the next month 
to make sure that we can kind of reset that partnership and are happy to return with more information. So will there be services there for mental health and addiction issues and health issues? Our traditional model in our shelters is very dependent on interconnection interconnectedness uh, of services and so we know that it will absolutely entail case management there on site and being able to connect folks uh, with the services that they need Catholic Community Services for example as also a behavioral health provider is often able to integrate different services and that'll be part of the conversations that we're having here over the next month and is that uh, once again is that for local folks or is that King County or even Pierce County. I mean, we're on the border here between Pierce County and King County. Yeah, the uh, shelter system does not have a specific referral model. And so we'll be wanting to partner with our uh, city partners here to understand how we want to be able to manage um, who's staying at the shelter uh, on an ongoing basis. Okay, uh, going over to the other building. So in Auburn, while you were during construction you had some folks living there will that will you be doing that here no our plan for the federal way property is to be permanent supportive housing from the onset um, so we're submitted our plans to the city um, and hoping to uh, get the review soon um, and so that we can start mobilizing and, and begin that work but the goal for for the health through housing site in federal way is to begin uh, as PSH where the full building would be available to us. And we're hoping that that construction will be done by next fall? Yeah, our, our goal is really to try to have some occupancy if we can by the bottom of the year. That's really, I think, being uh, you know ambitious. Um, and it really, I think, depends on our partnership uh, with some of our agreements that we've submitted um, and working out that timeline. But we would definitely uh, you know look forward to trying to work to try to I think, get those reviews um, so that then we can really work on a timeline that actually may fall into 2024. Um, thank you. And my last question is you mentioned that you have a code of conduct, a good neighbor agreement, safety and security plan, and a community relations plan. Are those written? and developed already yes so as part of the city's uh, to be <coughs> compliance with the city's code for the PSH uh, application the operational plan the community engagement and relations plan the safety security plan um, were all uh, a part of excuse me and um, uh, the code of conduct safety and, uh, and, and security uh, community engagement and relations plan and operational agreement are all a part of uh, that application and documents that needed to accompany what we then do is work with community to really kind of develop what we call a good neighbor agreement. Um, and we bring that group together to really, I think, come up with, you know, really, I think, a, a, a document that solidifies some of the, 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 the things as far as ongoing meetings and how we will continue to meet uh, with community as well as making sure that they have all the points of contact for the site and understand, I think, really how to get in contact if there's anything that uh, they'd like to uh, voice or if they'd like to actually, you know, build connection uh, with the site as well. Mayor, would we be able to see those documents <coughs> as a council? Uh, Brian Key. Key. So uh, everything that's submitted to the city is Keith, public. Would you, would you please introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Keith uh -huh. Niven, Community Development Director. Uh, so anything that's submitted as part of a permit application is public record. Uh, if the council wants to receive a copy of those, uh, let me know. More than happy to send. We would like. Well, I would like to receive a copy. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, just make sure they uh, get provided to the council. Thank you. Thank we'll you do. very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Casper Walsh. All right. I, I have several questions. Uh, first off, you, uh, I, I understand that resources will be available there. Uh, will resources, those resources, will the, the clients be required to accept those resources? Or could they say, hey, I know the resources are here, but we're not interested. We just want a warm place to live. So to that question, I would say that it's definitely choice. We don't necessarily are, are you know, mandating that services happen for folks, but the folks that be in, will be enrolled will go through again that suitability screening for enrollment and understanding, I think, what you know, the expectations are for health through housing and the site. And so they definitely understand that they'll be engaging with housing stability services, case management, behavioral health services, and really, I think, again, trying to 
understand what this person needs in order to be successful. Every person will be a little bit different, but we will engage every single person that comes through Health Through Housing. And again, it's it's not housing with the carrot of, of, of services. We want to make sure that folks are housed and then we will provide the wraparound services to really support folks throughout their recovery journey like I've kind of spoken to before. But it's not mandated that folks have services, but we will engage and continue to engage folks in services. And prior to folks enrolling, again, that suitability agreement really makes, you know, I think gives us a proper assessment on if someone will be successful at this level of care. Okay. Uh, n next question. Um, you, you're saying that, that, that you've had a 95% success rate. Uh, and my concern is, is the, the metric of that, of that success rate. Uh, the success rate that you're touting is that 95% of the people a year later are still housed. However, I think that, I mean, obviously this is a very vulnerable population. They need a lot of help. They need to make progress. And my concern is, is what kind of success rate is there on, on addiction recovery, on assuming greater uh, self-responsibility, uh, you know, being, being accountable for their actions, uh, greater self-reliance? What kind of success rate is there with those things that, that actually show that people are, are uh, improving. And, and I recognize that not everybody can be, uh, be has the potential to be totally self-reliant. But I think that everybody can increase their self-reliance. And so what kind of, of metric is there there? Yeah. We do produce an annual report for our Health Through Housing uh, portfolio every year, and we have a dashboard up uh, that speaks to engagement in services, understanding what kind of services are being provided and how effective they are. Um, I will say national standard is to be able to judge permanent supportive housing based on a uh, housing indicator. Um, and so I absolutely hear you in terms of other data points. Uh, what we know from past uh, thoroughly done research by the Journey Journal of uh, Medicine is that when folks are uh, given a permanent supportive housing unit, they do reduce engagement in hospitals, in jails, uh, and they increase their engagement in services. Uh, and so while we are continuing to measure things specifically for our health through housing portfolio and understanding and kind of that very specific sample how we can continue to improve access to services, uh, we're really also reliant on the overall model that has been proven time and time again. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just a couple more questions. Uh, you've talked about the, the code of conduct, and, and uh, I understand that, that you know, Keith says that it's been filed. Could we hear what some of the specifics are of the code of conduct that the, that the residents will be uh, required to, to abide by? So with the code of conduct, everybody engages as a community and um, the drug issue, um, I hear you guys um, asking about those. Hey, can you speak up? Please don't, please don't yell from the audience. Hey, would you please speak, speak in the microphone? Yes. Though? So basically, um, with the code of conduct, it's just um, respecting the community, respecting each other, um, keeping like, just like any other place that you stay in, it's going to be the same. Um, if you are using drugs, it cannot affect the community. Um, I'm not exactly sure what. I think our, our, our code of conduct is very specific. We have, uh, uh, we, it's, it's mandated. Everyone that's in, in the community has to agree to the, to the code of conduct. And, uh, um, and I, I can't recall it off the top of my head, but I know it's, uh, uh, it addresses all the, the, the issues to, to create a, a healthy community, respect, um, um, noise com complaint, uh, I mean, noise guidelines, um, um, quiet hours, any live-in community has a code of conduct. And that's the agreement that we have with every uh, resident. And we have, uh, we're, we're actually discussing what, what it would look like if there was a, a uh, someone that's behaving outside of that conduct, so we do have repercussions there so, uh, as well. Uh, so in other words, uh, illegal conduct would not necessarily be against the code of conduct? Um, illegal conduct as in? So, such as drug use would not be against the code of conduct? Uh, yeah, Kelly. Yeah, I think one of the framings that I will give you, and then uh, we'll make sure that you get that code of conduct in specifics and happy to engage in how we make sure that we've got something that's going to meet the city's uh, requirements. Um, 
with this portfolio, we are balancing the fact that these are folks' homes independently uh, and under landlord law. Um, when they are in their units, they are in their individual homes. And so balancing that against the fact that they are in a building um, that is part of a program, the code of conduct tries to strike that balance. Um, so when they are creating, as Hosi said, uh, an impact on the greater community and they aren't able to engage in a way that's productive and safe for all the residents and the neighboring community, that's where that code of conduct gets triggered. Um, if they're in a situation where they have no impact on the greater community, they're able to fulfill the requirements uh, under their lease, um, then that code of conduct would likely not get uh, implicated. Okay. All right, and my, my last question. Uh, you know, this is right next door to an apartment complex with, with several hundred children. Uh, will there be screenings uh, on, on sex offenders so that there's no sex offenders that are there? So what we intend to do is make sure that if folks are not able to live in this site based off of community zone restrictions or uh, any other restrictions, uh, they will not be able to be at that site. So that is a part of, you know, I think our enrollment process to ensure that if someone can't be that close based off one of our locations to either a school or a uh, you know, specific park or any of those type of things based off of any restrictions that they have, uh, then they will not be allowed to be in, you know, in our site. So that would screen somebody out of, of being able to be enrolled. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilor Dovey. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation so far. I just have maybe three questions. Um, and one is you mentioned in your presentation that veterans is a pretty big area of homelessness, correct? So, so why on the sheet where you say who we're going to have here, you don't have veterans listed as one of those people? You had lots of different communities, but you didn't have veterans on that one sheet. Are you speaking to Urban League slide? Well, the sh I can't remember. The sh I think Urban League's had a shot up there and it yeah. talked about, you know, all the different minority groups and people and however you do it, but veterans wasn't ma named at all. Yeah. Again, when we look at chronic homeless populations, it, 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 it varies. And so I just wanted to name that veterans who served our country are a part of this population. We do see a percentage of folks within our sites who were veterans as, as well as seniors. And so I was calling that out specifically yeah. to, 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 to and talk about And I appreciate that. that. I'm just making a suggestion. You might want to have that on the list as one of the target populations. Um, and the other, uh, the next second question I had is you talked about the code of conduct, and in the state of Washington we have tremendous um, rules and regulations on rentals, and if uh, somebody owns a house and somebody moves in there and they decide not to pay because it's winter and all that, you can't evict them, you can't make any changes. Will those same rules be on the population that's in this facility? Yes. Yeah, so. When folks sign leases within health through housing sites, they are covered under Fair Housing Act, just the same landlord tenancy as, as, as you or I if we were to, to sign a lease. And so, yes, those same uh, you know, laws are, are, are enacted for folks uh, once they sign leases within our sites that uh, are permanent supportive housing. Yeah. So my question is not so much the rules and regulations, because you're the experts and i got to believe you're going to do everything you can to make it good, good for the people there and the people in the city, but if you have an offender that just crosses the line for whatever reason, you probably won't be able to move them out because of the state laws of if you're in a house and it's winter and it's cold and you cross the line, you have, will you not have any say on how you police that? So I think at that time is when we pull in what we call care coordination and look at if this is the appropriate level of care. If this person is needing higher level of, of, of behavioral health or if they again having some behaviors we look at our mental health residential system for that level of support yeah. health through housing is a specific level of support for folks who really need to be able to have independence to their adls and be able to really kind of manage uh, certain behaviors in that setting so um, to your point we would yeah. really look for a different uh, level of, 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 of housing uh, instead of just really evicting that person back into homelessness okay and my last question is and if you could stay up there, Mr. Sweet. Um, I, I really appreciate your presentation. You Thank have you. been very informative. Yeah. You've got great statistics. Um, I can tell by just being there, you really are passionate about this. Absolutely. And, you know, we have this room here with, I'm sure it's kind of divided, half are all, all in and half are all, let's get rid of this. But 
So where do you think the disconnect is in the communication? As, as sitting here listening to you when you gave your presentation, it's like, right on, this is great, you're doing everything you can. And then on the other hand, you hear all the things that could go wrong and what's happening. Where's the communication breakdown so the citizens really know what's going on? And because I, and I've been listening up here for a year on this thing and it's back and forth, back and forth. Okay. And your presentation, I must compliment you, you'd be good in front of a boardroom, but uh, where's their disconnect in your opinion? I think we move at the speed of trust, the way that we like to talk about in King County, where I think ultimately, you know, continuing to, to engage, have these conversations, to get shared education, shared awareness around what this actual resource is. It's housing and not shelter. I think language is really important. And to continue to, to meet community, to understand those, those you know, uh, really uh, different ideas and, 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 and uh, you know, I don't know, anxieties around, I think, certain, uh, you know, issues that, that may or may not happen. And to continue to showcase, I think, that we do have a plan in place and that we have been successful. You know, health through housing, I think, what success looks like in health through housing is stability, right? And so that's why we talk about the retention uh, percentages and some of these other things. But I think there's not necessarily a huge disconnect other than I think we just need to continue to get in front of the community so folks can see that these are real folks in our community already and that we are bringing a resource that really will impact what we already see in this local community. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Council Member Sefa Dawson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for the presentation, and I do appreciate that we're moving forward with this. Um, actually, everybody pretty much asked my question, but one thing I think I'd like to say is that um, housing is really the foundation for stability. You can't get anywhere without housing, and so I think Let's get that out of the way and understand that this is a way to support people who are experiencing homelessness in our community and elsewhere. And so um, one question I have for you is when we talk about federal residents and talking about 35 to 65 percent, but it, they're also being served elsewhere, I'm sure. So do you track that and how do we make connect those so we know that our residents elsewhere are also being um, served wherever they choose or where they, wherever they happen to be? Is that something you are doing um, or not? <laughs> I want to clarify your question, Council Member. Uh, is the question that in addition to in our Federal Way building, folks who are homeless in uh, Federal Way may also be getting served elsewhere, and how are we working through that? Correct. Thank you. Um, so that is part of our partnership uh, with the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. They hold the regional coordinated entry system and are working through how to make sure that they are connected with the greater uh, provider network of folks that is identifying folks experiencing homelessness and being able to identify them as needing something like permanent supportive housing. Uh, the benefit, uh, we believe, in this complement of both local referrals and regional referrals is the ability both to say uh, where you're experiencing homelessness today may work best for you to be served tomorrow. Uh, you may be participating in a faith community. You may rely on specific service providers. Uh, you may have a specific um, set of family members uh, or neighbors that you know. Uh, oftentimes what we know is that folks who have experienced homelessness are no different than you or I, except that they have had to go through every single community connection to try to alleviate the emergencies that they are experiencing. And by the time they hit homelessness, they have no more places to go. Uh, and so being able to connect those folks with the community members or with the family members that are still connected with them is a huge part of both their resiliency and their ability to get stability. Uh, so to your question, that may happen by a local referral. It may actually happen by identifying that somebody who's currently experiencing homelessness in East King County has family in federal way. And the ability to be able to use those regional referrals to connect folks that say, hey, I'd love to be in federal way. I actually have a job offer um, where folks are, at, are you know, offering me the ability to have a small part-time job that's gonna meet my disability needs uh, is a part of our ability to really manage the whole region's need. Thank you. And with the code of conduct, um, one thing that was asked up here is around use um, of um, drug or alcohol and so I know somebody mentioned nuisance um, so if that could be included in there then if I as a neighbor of someone who's using um, I'm impacted by that I think that should also be considered because it's not just about that individual living in that unit 
but it also impacts the people around them. And so I think that should be something that has leverage. And then lastly, what I want to say is the community is here because they're concerned. And so it's, it's good to validate how the community feels whenever we engage or start something. And so, um, like I said, I do support housing because people do need housing. And I believe, um, I was gonna make the suggestion, but Council Member Dovey also brought it up, is community engagement on a regular basis, proactively, um, and having, or even having someone go to the community, local businesses, um, and just engaging and asking how things are for them um, proactively before something goes wrong, because one wrong thing is gonna com completely, yeah, derail uh, what the efforts. And so um, I think that would be a great way to really continue to engage the community and the people, especially around um, the properties that you're doing. And I just wish good luck, and I hope we continue to have these conversations on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember Tran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for being here, and thank you for providing this critical service to um, our community. Um, as a former refugee person and homeless person by definition, I am grateful for this service that you provide to the community. And also I want to reassure the community that as a former refugee and a homeless person, I can reassure you that we are no threat to the community or to you. Um, Having said that, I do have uh, two questions for you. Uh, question one is, let's say, uh, take me for example. Let's say I'm a homeless person with substance abuse, alcoholic, and things like that, and staff refer, make the referral to you. Can you walk me through the timeline, the, the, the processes? What's gonna happen to me on day one or day 17, or day 15, what is the process? So when a person is referred, um, they'll be referred, they'll be assigned a case management manager, and everybody will be assessed. So you'll be assessed and say you are have alcohol use or um, drug use disorder. Um, they'll be able to know where to to refer you. We have behavioral health navigators. We have a lot of uh, support services if you want a job. Um, there'll just be a lot of services around where that person, but we meet everybody where they are. Okay. Is there, did that answer your question? Yes, let me follow up with that. So when you make the referral, how long do I need to wait before I can receive the service? Oh, behavioral health services will be right on the spot. Okay. We'll have our behavioral health navigators right then and there. As soon as you come in, you'll be able to meet your counselor or your case manager, and then they'll be able to refer you as soon as possible, within a week at least. Okay, beautiful, thank you. My uh, second question is, since I'm a chairperson of the finance, so I'm interested in the money portion of it, um, can you, can you, do you have any data that you can share on average cost per person, um, how much are we spending per person to house them and to, to provide wraparound services? So Health Through Housing's uh, principle is really uh, to provide uh, operations to our, to our providers at $25,000 a unit uh, is really what our uh, initial operations dollars is. Uh, we have 5% then baked in annually to try to keep up with inflation uh, so that those ongoing supports can continue um, and recognizing in uh, some of the challenges with work uh, force challenges as well as really just I think all in prices for all in costs for what it really uh, takes to, to, to support somebody in permanent supportive housing. Um, that's again the case management, housing stability, behavioral health, uh, and all the different other wraparound holistic kind of services that uh, this person may uh, be able to, to engage in while they're there. So it uh, starts off with uh, 25000 per unit, um, and then we look at annual 5% baked in for uh, ongoing operations. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. A great answer to those, to those questions. I'm sure many are, are more to come. 
Um, so um, uh, please uh, make yourself comfortable. And thank you for, again for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. I remember uh, when I toured uh, the site uh, for a second time, I remember uh, uh, saying that I thought that was going to be very important uh, that we have a session I exactly like this. I told uh, uh, Dow, uh, uh, Chief, um, the uh, County Executive Dow Constein, um, uh, his uh, Chief of Staff, uh, Shannon uh, Braddock, was present uh, for that, and long, uh, many other people uh, were present as well. And I, I thought a session like this would be absolutely essential uh, to make sure that the community is aware of the circumstances and be able to ask questions. So thank you very much for a their, very thorough presentation. Um, okay, now the most important part of the evening is to hear from you. So um, I'll call off some names. We have uh, quite a number of pink sheets. Please uh, stay on target for time. Uh, green means go. You've got everybody's got three minutes. And uh, yellow means uh, uh, you're, you're coming up to it. It's uh, it's the yellow light. That means you've got about 30 seconds. And then red means please stop. And I don't like to interrupt people. So if you've got maybe a sentence, but let's not go on for uh, uh, too long. Uh, we uh, the council just asks. Uh, that you identify the community you live in. We don't need your address. We already, uh, many of you have provided that here. Um, obviously, the code of public comment uh, was, was contained on the pink sheets, uh, but I just think that we want to make sure, I think you're, uh, people recognize that you're a lot more persuasive um, when we are, are concise and to the point in regard to the issues at hand. Um, and uh, just remember, we're all neighbors. I know it's a very passionate issue, uh, but let, let's, uh, let's engage on an intellectual level um, you know, passion is good, but let's let's uh, uh, do our best. I know that many people uh, feel defensive for their community, and I and I think that you could argue uh, both sides on this. But let's uh, let's engage on the issues. Uh, with that, why don't I call out? Uh, we'll have people queue up, and we'll do. Um, um, I will announce a, a, a number of folks, and uh, if I don't call out your name initially, it just means you're in the queue, uh, as they say. So uh, the first few, we've got uh, Betty Taylor, Vivian Alexander. Victor Martinez, Susan Strong, and Aaron Walsh. That's the uh, that's the first batch. Uh, with that, Betty Taylor. Good to see you, Betty. My name is Betty Taylor, and everybody knows that my grandson was murdered three years ago. So now we're in a, we're, we're in a trial right now, okay, with the courts. And I'm not, I don't, I, I, don't, I, I just want to, <clears throat> let me read something first. There are times when you must speak, not because you are going to change the other person, but because if you don't speak, they have changed you. My grandson's death, going to trial. I believe so that this is going to make me an even better advocate than I've ever been before. Because I'm walking and I'm seeing things in a different light. I'm like, oh my God, we're in this position and I feel like I need help. I need support. I need support. When I came here to, 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 today, I, um, I was like, oh my God, I was so like discombobulated and, and I walked in a room. And you know the load that I had lifted off of me. And you know why? Because I'm here with my peeps. That meant a whole lot to me, to just be in the room with my peeps. And I'm asking, um, it would good, be good if my peeps could show up in court with my family because this is me. I live in a better way. Gun violence has to stop. We need to support each other. We need to be there when we, when, we need to be there for each other. Support is not just saying, I'm going to pray for you. Support is being there when you're needed. Support is 
is, you know what? I don't even care if you give me a hug. I don't even care if you shake my hand. I don't even care if you call me on the phone. That's what we need during this time because we, we're going to be in court 30 days. This is day two. We got to go back tomorrow. I came from court here to be with my peeps. I must say. Thank you, Betty. Our prayers are with you and your family. Vivian Alexander. Okay. Good evening, good evening Mayor Farrell, Council President, Coach Mar, Council members, members of the community. I'm here tonight to speak in favor and in support of Housing First, permanent supportive housing, which will be located at 1400 South 320th Street and managed by the Urban League. And I am so happy and is so appreciative that the Urban League was here tonight. Um, I've been waiting for that uh, for a year now. We've all had some serious questions about the success of um, Housing First. I was a chemical dependency for, counselor for 25 years. My model was the 12-step model. Um, I'm a volunteer with Fusion. Uh, Fusion has a different model. What's missing here is the housing first model, I believe. I didn't think so when I very first heard it, maybe three years ago. Um, but after, well, first of all, I'd like to say I have great confidence in the city council. Between the city council, between the Urban League, between the community who has had all of these questions, look at the energy and the power that we all have together. I think that as, um, once this starts moving forward and we do have these monthly meetings, um, things will work out. My faith community is in Auburn, so I'm a member of White River Buddhist Temple. We've worked with the city of um, Auburn for years now and um, moving toward what now they have is Don's Place. I'm hoping that the city of Federal Way and the community members, I, I'm hoping that we can get past calling this facility, the drug place, and the place where we're gonna go, um, somebody's gonna open the door to one of the apartments and find a person dead on the floor. I hope that we can get past the part that says these apartments will be filthy. Why, why does that have to happen? Why can't it be successful if all of these people, all, all this money, all these services are in place for everyone? My belief, is I'd like to call it Hope's residence or the residence of hope. We need to have we need to humanize instead of dehumanize. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Victor Martinez. Yes, Mayor City Council Vic Martinez. I'm a, a 28 year Army veteran, um, a 17 year uh, resident here in Federal Way. Thank you for t for tonight and the opportunity to speak. And uh, appreciate all the comments from the from the council members, and uh, but but I would tell you just like in the military, we used to say oh, that all briefs well in PowerPoint, but uh, but the reality of execution is a whole other thing. And uh, I noticed on one of the slides it says what what has been accomplished, and then what what is intended to do, uh, what what the intentions. But intentions um, versus what you do, there's a big difference. Intentions don't get results. And I think overall, you know, we talk about uh, housing, a housing short, a homeless issue. But really, I think we're missing the, the root of this is a drug issue. Um, that's, the bottom of the, that's the bottom line here. Uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, Council Members Wash, you know, as far as uh, the rehab and the services. You know, if there's re services uh, uh, provided, but if, if they refuse to use them, then there's not going to be any rehabilitation. I think it should be mandated. Um, crime is an issue in, in the city, and, um, you know, people want to feel safe. And I just, I just feel, my opinion, and a lot of conversations with other neighbors, uh, some who happen to be friends of mine that work for King County, they're not, are not allowed to make comments saying that this is going to be a debacle. And um, so people don't feel safe already. Uh, and, and I think this is going to attract more crime. So I think there's got to be some measures put in place uh, to, to make sure that, that, that the crime doesn't increase in, in all the drug use. Um, 
But I know one of the other comments was made, you know, that drug use cannot affect the community, and it is affecting our community. Um, I know this weekend I, I did a, a, a bunch of litter pickup around the Fred Meyer and the Safeway with uh, a group, the Stand Up for Federal Way, and there was so much drug stuff that I found, that we found picked up everywhere, and it's sad, it's sad. And so I was kind of oblivious to some of that, and, uh, but this weekend was eye-opening for me because it it's not a homeless issue, it's a drug issue. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Susan Strong. Mayor Farrell, Council President Kochmar, Council Members. I'm Susan Strong and I live in Federal Way. I have concerns about the homeless housing at the extended stay. The shelter will provide 101 units of permanent supportive housing and will be managed by Urban League in partnership with Catholic Community Services. We must give them a chance to operate this as per their plan, but after years of dealing with the day center, I have grave concerns about what effect this facility will have on the surrounding area. Our experience with the day center operated by Catholic Community Services is that it is open less than 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday. Yet the homeless, drug-addicted people hang around the area 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The garbage and debris is allowed to pile up in the parking lot and public sidewalk. My imagination tries to picture the extended stay facility with a quiet parking lot in the evening. There will be no people hanging around with their shopping carts full of stuff covered by a tarp. There certainly will be no people gathered together drinking or smoking. I can't picture anyone passed out in the parking lot. I can't picture that. At the last city council meeting, I asked if it was possible for the day center to provide all of their services while keeping their parking lot and surrounding sidewalks clear of people and garbage. Tonight I'm asking if the extended stay can keep their parking lot and surrounded sidewalks clear of people and garbage. Thank you. All right, thank you. Aaron Walsh. Mayor Farrell, members, members of the council, thank you so much for your work. Uh, my name is Aaron Walsh. I'm a resident of Federal Way and I work as a social worker in Federal Way. <clears throat> I want to ask that you do everything you can to facilitate the Health Through Housing program in Federal Way. This vital program will help people escape the trauma and danger of the streets and give them access to life-saving support. This is an incredible opportunity to create options for emergency housing and permanent supportive housing in our city. As a social worker, I have had the opportunity to work with many clients who sleep outside and don't have a stable home. As you can imagine, it's a hard life. It breaks my heart when I encounter people who are ready to make changes, but due to lack of stable housing, it is sometimes almost impossible to access services. How does one remember to go to appointments when all of one's belongings are routinely stolen and there is no way of telling the date or time? How does one do the deep emotional and spiritual work of healing from trauma and pursuing sobriety if you don't know where your next meal is coming from or where you'll sleep that night? I hope the city and its partners embrace a housing first philosophy whereby potential clients are housed in emergency housing or permanent supportive housing regardless of where they are in their healing and recovery journeys. As I said before, stable housing is a vital foundation to accessing services and making changes. In addition, relapse and slips are common even among those most committed to recovery from addiction. People engaged in the recovery journey need compassion, grace, and consistent support. If they lose housing with every setback, lasting change will be that much more difficult to achieve. And of course, I want to say there are many, many people who sleep outside who do not have any issues with addiction. The cost of living is simply out of control, especially for people with disabilities. The National Alliance to End Homelessness promotes a housing first philosophy because research indicates that people who are housed with housing first methods are more likely to remain housed in the long term and engage with support services that promote sobriety, better health, fewer hospital visits, and fewer jail stays. 
at the end of the day, these individuals are already our neighbors. The only question is, will they continue to sleep outside or will we help them find a home? So please, please, please support the Health Through Housing Program. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, the next six. Uh, Kevin Morris, uh, Juan Juarez Ramos, uh, Mark Fridas, Ron Kaler, Lana Bostic, and Ken Blevins. We'll start with Mr. Morris. <coughs> Mayor Farrell, Council President Kochmar, Council. Uh, first of all, I want to commend the council for the questions that they asked the presentate the people the presenters because the presenters did not bring up anything about drug addiction or drug use in their presentation it had to come from questions from you it's a major concern obviously and what was mentioned by Susan earlier with with the debacle at the day center we see that possibly happening in front of both locations or maybe three locations, whatever, how many they want to do. <clears throat> so it is a major concern to me. And another concern I have, or wonder, or question that I have, is when the people, it was made, it mentioned that these residents, when they do get qualified or accepted into their facility, it's like their own private home. Well, in the state of Washington, Drugs are legal, so there, there's nothing they can do as far as the drug use in their own, in their own home, so, so, call, so called. So and another question that I have too is, I pay property taxes as we all do, residents, we all pay property taxes. Who's paying the property tax on the extended stay on the Red Lion and other properties? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can tell you, sir, that the uh, it'll be it's a King County owned property. And um, oh, and uh, the thanks to the legislature and, and thank you, uh, Representative, the legislature had an executive session last year, affixed the drug law and now they did essentially recriminalize uh, uh, drug laws, uh, uh, drugs in the, in the state of Washington. Okay, uh, next is uh, Juan Juarez Ramos. It's Juan Luis Juarez Ramos. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. <laughs> um, hello, uh, Mayor Farrell, uh, Council President Kochmar, and members of the City Council, and the members of the community. Oh, wow, there's a lot more people than I thought. <laughs> um, let me re reintroduce myself. I have been talking to these meetings, been through a lot of activacy for years, and I'm only 17 years old, but I have the eye bags and the gray hairs of a 70-year-old man. <laughs> I serve in the City of Federal Way as a Youth Commissioner, Chair of the Commission, but I am here as an individual today. I'm a senior at Thomas Jefferson High School. I was the Latino Student Union's Treasurer last year. I ran for ASB President, unfortunately I lost. I was a class senator for, four, for three years. I serve a lot, and I care a lot about my community. I, I live right outside of Federal Way, though I'm right next to Military Street. Military Road, I'm sorry. So, I see the actions, I see what's going on in our community. I come here a lot to talk mostly about the crime and homeless in Military Road. When I heard about the housing um, program that's gonna be coming here, I was excited, I'll be honest. I heard from both sides, from the people who oppose it, from the people who want it. I'm very happy that the people who presented came here today. But in my good conscience, we cannot support this. There are many high schoolers in this district who are homeless, but cannot find housing. At Thomas Jefferson High School, we have a health point center, open for all students in the district. I am an advocacy for them, ambassador, in fact, for them, lobby for the health, for the health point in DC. But yet, we don't have anything good homes for our children. How can these new generation leaders be lead, ready to lead our city, created by an opportunity, but yet have no home to sleep, to eat, to study. 
That's why I must ask the leaders of this new program to please look into this. This is our children. These are our next leaders. In 30 years, maybe I will be right there, hopefully. But this may be my last city council meeting attending as I'll be officially committing to Pace University in Westchester, New York, where I'll be majoring in political science. Thank you. But it is not because of everything I have done, but it's because of you guys here. Getting a little emotional. But I first want to thank you so much, this community, from both sides, from the leaders of our city, and to the staff of the city of Federal Way, and to our legislators as well. I thank you very much on the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Mark Freitas. Uh, Mark Freitas, 909 South 336th Street, Suite 101, Federal Way, Washington. Uh, and I also live in this community. I am proud to see that the community has come out to, to hear this important issue. Mayor Farrell, council members, esteemed state representative, and my wife. Um, there has to be a better way than not in my backyard. You know, I have a backyard too, and um, the situation in my backyard sometimes fills the neighborhood, but there has to be a better way. Um, so many programs, so little successes. Look around. There's a lot of money going out there. What are our actual successes? Process three by the end of the year? Come on. Look at your own process as far as fixing up a shelter that, that works really well. I would like to leave one bit of uh, places to look at. Valley Cities, right here in Federal Way, headquartered, also providing programs in Federal Way, has a program called Phoenix. I know that you've looked at it, but look around. It is, it would be successful, I think, in federal way, and it would help resolve some of the issues that we have. Mayor Farrell, thank you very much for your time. Council members, Christine Reeves, and most of all, my wife for putting up with my baloney. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Ron Kaler. Yes, uh, good evening, Ron Kaler, longtime resident, 20 years plus. Uh, I got multiple properties in the community here. My kids raised here, uh, and I live uh, not too far from where this facility is. And uh, there's a neighborhood directly back behind it that was canvassed the last few days, uh, asking people's input about what this issue is all about. And there were a lot of negative responses. And um, I've done outreach down in uh, the city of Fife with my church down there, with encampments, with people there, with uh, people that have been in the addiction uh, world for a long time. And I tell you, the success rate is minimal. It requires a choice, a sincere choice and desire to get out of this. I see this facility becoming a flop house. I see your uh, behavior requirements as minimal at best. I don't see consequences for uh, violations of, of, of the requirements. I see this as, as a place that, that's going to be a big negative issue because it's right across from Safeway. This is where everybody's going to have to go get their food. And Safeway right now is already a drug issue that my daughter came home last night and she said, in fact, it wasn't even nighttime, shopping there and she said, Dad, this is incredible. This is getting so bad. I, I, I don't want to go in there. This is my neighborhood. Right across the street is this extended stay. It's not going to get better. These people don't have jobs. They don't have an income. They've got addictions. It's a drug issue. It's not a homeless issue, okay? 
It's a drug issue. And if they don't get rehab as ASAP, it extends and continues and continues and continues. And they die. I had to help a lady being resuscitated on the sidewalk over in 312, probably about a month and a half ago because she OD'd right there. It was sickening, hands turning blue. It, that's what's happening in the city. And I don't see this as a positive resource for our city. And I vote no for it. And I thank you for all the input for our city council, mayor, and everyone here. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. <laughs> Lana Bostic. I just had eye surgery and I can't figure out how to see very well. Um, Mayor and uh, council members, uh, my name is Lana Bostic and I have lived in Federal Way since 1981. I'm also the chair of the Federal Way Senior Ad uh, Advisory Commission, but I am speaking only for myself at this time. I want to voice my support for the health through housing program and also hope that an emergency shelter is open in Federal Way soon. We have had an issue with homeless people for years now and real little progress has been made, except for the opening of the day center, which is helping many, many people with resources for health care, for counseling, and it's a safe place to be for a few hours each day. Over a year ago, um, I sent to the council um, an article that was in the New York Times in August of 2023 about health through housing in Houston and how it was successful there. Um, I don't know if any of you looked at it and I sent a copy to you, Mayor, today. So if you have questions about if this works or not, you can always check that article. Um, and um, I know that last spring at the Fusion event, the author Greg Colburn was a speaker and he wrote the book Homelessness is a Housing Problem. Um, he's a professor at the University of Washington and I was told that some of the council did buy the book. I'm not sure if you read it. It's kind of hot. It's kind of dry. I think it's basically his dissertation, but it does have um, evidence based information on how this program does work in many, many cities, Houston being probably the biggest one. Um, <clears throat> so what, in, what is the council in federal way done? The last time, um, I was here about, or there was a meeting about using the Stevenson hotel as a shelter. Then there was a long discussion about if private schools and public schools were the same. And if it was too close, I'm not sure if any of that ever got decided. And then they passed, you passed an, I don't know if it's an ordinance or a law about people pushing shopping carts. That doesn't seem to be working, but it is a cruel punishment for our most vulnerable population. I am also pl pleased to see that a church-led summit on homelessness was held to talk about this issue. And I hope that it is a very important issue that we have an emergency, sh emergency shelter for people who are released from the hospital with nowhere to go and for people in immediate crisis. So I'm calling for the council to support the action and provide housing for people. There are solutions in our community and we need to work together to solve this. It is not 1965 any longer and Federal Way continues to change. May I finish? Of course. And Federal Way needs to change and the ability to help homeless people seems to be a very important issue at this time. It's very difficult to see people hard sleeping on the streets and also to see so many businesses with plywood on the windows. And I believe that the Health Through Housing Program will provide the resources and the care that people need so they, that we can improve our community. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Alon. <laughs> Ken Blevins. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I, I could spend hours on this, honestly, and it's really disconcerting that this presentation we had today, not one of you said anything about addiction, and it just <laughs> sickens me, honestly, because I'm out in those woods and I see these people. I thought I was just original. I was like, get rid of these people. It's, it's gross. There's it, dirty. There's garbage everywhere. Um, there's a dead girl on the ground, and, and I was kind of like blaming them for it. But 
Um, and I'm sorry I'm really emotional about this, but um, I had a family here, and I wanted to go out there and make sure my family was safe, and then I found out there's a lot of other people that are unsafe. And when you don't bring up the actual problem, but you bring up the symptom, and you fix the symptom but not the problem, what are you going to get? You still have the problem, right? So you're going to house people. Um, why don't you just house them and require them to get treatment right there in that facility? They get to live there safely, not in the woods where they're getting abused, raped, assaulted. In these buildings that you guys have in Seattle, it's a mess. How many 911 calls have you had in those buildings that you guys have up there? How much, how safe is it there? It isn't. You can't put women and children in these places. There's a fentanyl all over the walls. There's meth all over the walls. That's why that one building hasn't opened up. This guy in facilities, and I'm sorry, I'm not like pointing this at you. Nothing's your guys' fault. But you got, we got to stop making money off of this thing. We got to start fixing this problem, okay? But you know that you're fixing these buildings because it's a, they're meth houses. They're fentanyl everywhere, and people are getting poisoned from it, and so on. And the reason why is because we're not focused on the problem. And I'm sorry, we have council members here that have experienced homelessness. I know you guys are really um, uh, you know, passionate about that as well, but this is not a refugee problem. It's a drug problem, and it's very important that we say this. I'm so happy that we have council members up here that do get it, that have spoken directly of that and have the great questions for you, for you guys. Because we're educated here. We've seen it. We've been out there in the woods, and we don't want to see this again. We want, these are human beings. They have families that are waiting for them. They're breaking their hearts while their children are dying and are coming from all over because we're helping them to come over here. And we have Catholic Community Services over there opening up this day center, and it's just inviting everybody there with nothing to give them. You know, they can't take them to, into treatment because they're from Pierce County and they don't, have, uh, uh, um, they don't have insurance for it to be able to do it in King County. You can't invite people from Pierce County here because they can't get help here, okay? So that's a problem. That might be a state problem that we have, but the problem we have, the reason why we have this problem is because our state representatives have voted for this homeless uh, industrial complex, okay? They're funding something that's not funding of addiction problems and stuff like that. We do not have those services. We've been out there to ask people, would you want to go into service? Can we bring you there right now? Even if we could, even if we, like right now, we could swoop them up and help them up because we want to help them. We, there's nowhere to take them. Okay, that's the problem. Quit spending billions of dollars on housing when you can house them in a facility where they can get help now. Thank you very much. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next six speakers uh, Jeffrey Tancredi, Larry Moe, uh, Jacqueline Copley, um, I need my glasses, um, Joel Lee, Anna Patrick. How many is that? Uh, let's do one more. George Houston. All right, Mr. Tancredi. Good evening, Mayor, Council President Coach Mark, Council members. Jeff Tancredi, a Federal Way resident for many years, West Campus area. Uh, Mayor and Council and audience, uh, for the past three days, I've door knocked on in the neighborhoods that are right next to the uh, Extended Stay Hotel. Uh, Monday, yesterday, I knocked on every single door in the Uptown Square community. Uh, as you know, Uptown Square is made up of a lot of minorities, Afghan refugees, uh, Somalis, I mean, you name it, it's a, quite a cross-section. I didn't find one person that was in favor, it, in, in favor of it, and this is what I told them. I said, we're here to let you know, because I'm a volunteer with Stand Up Federal Way. I said, we're here to let you know that King County bought that hotel right over there, and I pointed. I said, they bought that hotel, and they're going to put the... Uh, the drug addicted homeless in that facility without any requirement for treatment. And they just shook their head and they said, no, they have to go into treatment. Every single person that I talked to in Uptown Square and even the individuals that couldn't speak English, I motioned with my phone. I said, is it possible that you can, we can, you know, just by you know, talking to them to get your son or daughter, a family member that uh, can you know, that I can talk to. So they got their phone out and they called their son or daughter and then their son or daughter talked to me and I explained to them, I'm Jeff Tancredi, I'm a volunteer, I'm here at the door talking to your family and I'm explaining to them that King County bought that hotel right on the other side of where your parents live that, and they're gonna put the 
the drug addicted in there without any requirement for treatment. So I'm speaking for Uptown Square. Okay, they don't want it. They don't want it, Mayor. I talked to a lot of people and they do not want this. Okay, as a volunteer with Stand Up, I've been to, as Ken said, I was with him three years ago, going out into the encampments and talking to the drug addicts. We went in and we cleaned up those encampments. At that time, unfortunately, we didn't get a lot of help from the city. Different story now. It's a much different story now because we have a great council that works with us that's not backed by King County. That's the difference. We had to change, we had to change our city council because the last council didn't listen to us about this. These folks are drug addicted. They need help. They need to be in a treatment facility 24 seven monitored by medical professionals. So you can take the first floor of that extended stay hotel and you staff it with medical professionals. That's what they need. Because when we went to the encampments, they, didn't want, they don't want to be integrated into society. They don't want to, okay? So they either go to jail or they go to treatment. But we don't want them to go to jail, but they need treatment. And so this is just, as somebody said, it, it is like it's gonna be a flop house. So did anybody talk to Uptown Square or the Mirror Lake neighborhood? No, they didn't. Why not? Thank you. All right, thank you. Larry Moe. Is Larry Moe here? Larry? All right. Um, Jacqueline Copley. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, I would like to sincerely thank all of you for asking really good questions. I think out of all the meetings I've ever been to, those were, I really appreciated the quality of questions. And um, I'm Jacqueline Copley. I moved here in 1989 with my family. I've lived and worked in this area for since then. Um, and I wanted to speak to what Jack said. Jack had asked kind of what the disconnect was between the people who wanted the shelter and the people who didn't. And the disconnect is, I guess to be honest with you, we don't feel like we have been being told the truth from the beginning. I don't, can't find my notes, so I'm just gonna go from the top here. I believe it was House Bill 1590. I believe it was that. And initially, the funding was going to be raised for, uh, for um, arts and cultural arts. I can't remember what the origin of the bill was. I want to say 2015 or 2017. And then it morphed into all these forms of housing. And then the voters had to vote for a tax increase on the sales tax. But they didn't have time to implement that. And so they decided to go around it. And they decided to vote on it and make it so that the county officials and the city officials would vote for that tax increase and, and usurp the people's voting power. It started with that. So that's one area where trust was taken away from the public because we didn't get a vote on that. We haven't had a say, a lot of a say in anywhere through this process. So these buildings were bought according to our mayor without his, um, without his, you know, his involvement. He was kind of told we're buying these. Then they purchase them and we are like, we're concerned about this. I taught at Mirror Lake Elementary. It's walking distance. The kids are going to walk right past that. Young kids, and they're already finding needles there. Things have transitioned from needles into the fentanyl, as most of you already probably know. But there's a young mother there with six children that has to, she told me this herself, had to keep her kids in the car so she could walk the walkway to pick up the needles because her children were playing with them. That is a problem. And so when we don't hear you include the drugs, I care about these kids. You're coming from a different city, but these are kids I taught. They're kids that um, if something happened to them, I mean, I don't know, I would care probably anybody's kids anywhere, but they're, they're ours. They're, it's our community. And so we want truth. We want transparency. We don't want to feel like we're being lied to. Um, there was, I know remediation had to be done on the hotel at the Red Lion. The remediation, I know, it came out in the media was um, from the drugs that were permeating the walls and the fire department couldn't clear it. That wasn't mentioned, that feels dishonest. There's so many things being, uh, we have to investigate or do public information requests. Instead of just saying, hey, here's the pros, here's the cons, here's what we're working with, treatment needs to be mandatory for them too. It's like a concentration camp of people walking around just slowly dying. They look just like the people in the concentration camps during World War II. It's horrible. And it's not that people are heartless, it's that they want better for their community and for these people because they care about them. And they want their kids not to see that. Thank you. Julie. Hi, 
Hi, Mayor and Council Member. My name is Jewel Lee, and we own the home directly behind this hotel. We share a fence with this hotel. And the front of the hotel faces 320th. To the right is the Uptown Apartments. To the left, it's another business. But behind, it's a neighborhood with families. And our number one concern is safety. I think we're all here because we care and we want to see change. And I think you guys are actively working towards that. But I can't help but notice my property taxes are rising, but the neighborhood itself is going down. As somebody else mentioned, even just going to Safeway to buy my family groceries, I know that I'm going to be harassed. I'm going to be asked for money. I'm going to be stopped five times from my vehicle to the front door of the store. The store also now has, I don't know if they're armed, but guards that have to guard the door 24 hours a day. And that's scary. And I think the number one concern, my number one priority is my family, then the community. And I need to know that my two small children will be safe. Again, we share a fence. We're not just in the neighborhood. I climb over the fence, I'm on the property. And when we first moved there four and a half years ago, it was a hotel. Then a year later, the county bought it. Then for maybe two months or so, there were refugees there. Then the property has essentially been vacant for two years. I see a car every once in a while in the parking lot. But I'm wondering, is this our tax dollars sustaining this empty building for years? Yeah. Years. And um, I personally would like to see, like many have said, mandated treatment and 24-hour security. If you're going to proceed, it very much feels like the decision has been made. And this is just a, let's pacify the community by giving them an opportunity to say how they feel. I, I would agree that I don't feel very much involved. My first real notification of this, I, I had murmurings as I'm driving home and I'm pulling in my driveway and on that shared fence is that post-it note. I live down a dead end. Who was going to see that there? I haven't seen the sign anywhere else in the community, but it's shoved on a fence down a dead end near my home. And I will be brief because I see a 45 seconds. I have three family members that are addicts. One is actually now deceased. And I know firsthand that handing an addict a set of keys to a home is not going to resolve the issue. Like many have said, it's not, I, I think nobody wants to see the homeless out on the street. But what we want to see is those with mental health issues and addictions treated. And, and I don't know the law surrounding this, but I too would like to see it mandated that if you're a resident in this house, you have to commit to treatment and random UAs. We do that through the judicial system when somebody is caught selling or using drugs, right? We mandate drug testing. I think knowing that there would be 24-hour security and that mandated drug testing and treatment, I think you could change the minds of a lot of community members who are on the fence about whether they want this in their community. It's just being open and transparent is all we ask for. Yep. And like I said, I share a fence. So though there's people in the community, it's in my next door. It's in my backyard. So I am very passionate about wanting to make sure that if you're going to move forward with this, that safety is the number one priority for the community. Thank you. Anna Patrick. Good evening, um, Mayor, Council, President. Did I get that right this time? Uh, council and community. What we know based on what has been shared before and what we have experienced so far. This will be housing for active drug users and severe mentally ill individuals who will be allowed to use drugs in their homes. Drug treatment will not be required and our, our tax dollars are paying for this. Drugs will be obtained in the community via drug dealers. Some residents will have arrest warrants. Rooms are intended for couples, so this could double the numbers. As at least half will be imported from other cities. If someone is kicked out of the facility, they will be added to the homeless population in the streets if they're kicked out. Other permanent supportive housing facilities are closing down or are being blocked. And one has to wonder if this is leading to a shift towards other cities that lack the financial means to fight back. 
Our local day shelter is a regional magnet for homeless individuals and has been a chronic nuisance to our community. It has been shared that referrals will come from the Day Center Catholic Community Services. There is an anticipated growth in the homeless population despite this hotel. This will increase demand for police and fire significantly. Uh, this facility will try to circum circumvent calling 911 and utilize congregate services instead. This is information that I've gathered. Uh, it will be difficult to measure the full impact of res on residents of hotel and nearby communities, and it will be difficult to know what exactly our tax dollars pay for behind closed doors. Our city needs living wage jobs and missing middle housing. According to Washington State Department of Commerce, our city is missing the upper income brackets of housing to bring balance to our city. We are working to make this happen. King County has intentionally held our city back with best starts for kids initiatives to prevent gentrification in South King County. This only widens the income gaps between East King County and South King County. Federway has been greatly impacted by the initiative to close the youth jail. They think we want, it, want to close the jail um, because, um, where bullets fly, if you can believe that. Does that build trust? The money saved by King County has not followed the need in our communities. Crime prevention initiatives have not served the most extreme cases that continue to greatly impact our communities. Diversion programs are not supposed to impact public safety and the current metrics do not tell the full story, nor are they accurate. King County has stated that they are matching communities in these permanent supportive housing facilities. It is still unclear what that means. Federal Way has the highest number of tax-exempt low-income housing units in all of King County. It's imperative that we address these structural issues rather than exacerbate them through ill-conceived ideas. By using taxpayer funding, funds to facilitate drug use in this housing, we risk, can I finish? It's two small paragraphs. Okay. We risk, um, by using taxpayer funds to facilitate drug use in this housing, we risk perpetuating cycles of addiction and failing to address the underlying issues. The potential influx of drugs from local dealers into our neighborhoods poses a serious threat to public safety. Please figure out a better plan that works for everyone. Our children and our community deserve to look around and see a bright future where they can feel safe and thrive. Stop passing the buck and burden to South King County cities where people work hard to make ends meet and deserve the same quality of life as those living in the upper income communities. Thank you. George Houston. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members and all of those that have gathered here today. You know, I, I really count it a privilege to live in Federal Way where there's such community engagement. I've talked to many people about this issue and I find that they're very passionate about homelessness and the issues that surround this. But you know, there's a saying that past results are the best indication of the future. And having said that, there is a group that has experience dealing with those who have been uh, alcoholics and addic addicted people and people even suffering with mental illness. And it hasn't been the state. It has been the church. And recently we convened a gathering. We had over 25 churches gathered together representatives from them to, uh, on this issue of homelessness. And many of these individuals are going out and they are seeking to build relationship because many of these people have been traumatized by what they've gone through. They are addicted, they have mental illness, there's other issues there. Putting them into a room does not remove those conditions. And so what we are seeking to do is to build relationship. What we're lacking is a public place that we can gather those individuals. And unlike some programs, we do have a desire to have programming for them. Because we believe that there are four stages of moving a person from human suffering to human flourishing. And the first one is like humanitarian aid. You know, you come along and you see somebody, they're hungry, they're in need, and you got something for them. Another one is disaster relief. Something terrible happened. This person is freezing. They're, they're in a bad condition, and you're, you're responding to that incident. The third one, though, 
is, is on a more higher level, this community development. And I really believe that this is an effort to look at how we can put together a, a community development that will address this more holistically. But the way that the church approaches this is the fourth way, and that is life transformation. We believe that it's necessary that people will have their lives transformed. And we believe it's possible. I know some people say that this addict will always be an addict. But I want you to know that today there are individuals from churches that are going out into the community on a regular basis and they are grabbing people and they're snatching them out of the fire. They're working with them. They're walking with them. They're helping them to be able to overcome this addiction that grips them. Somebody describes it. They say they want these drugs more than they want the air that they breathe, more than the water they drink, more than the food they eat. But that power can be broken. And I want you to know that when I hear all of what is being said, I, I, I want to say, Mayor, in 2018, there was a commission, a report that came back and said, in order to address this issue, there are a couple of things that must be done. I just want to cite two of them. One of them was said, that you must be realistic. You must look at the truth. You must be willing to see the truth. You can't close your eyes to that. But the second one was that it must be holistic. I do not believe that there is a one size fits all that is going to address this. I believe we need something for those that are transitioning out of, of the foster care system. But we need something for those parents that are just struggling to be able to pay the rent when their average amount of income in this city is $4,000 and rent is $2,200. We need people, we need programs like that. We need programs that are going to help, but we must have accountability. If we refuse to do that, we would be just like, a, a, we said we're not offering them, we're, we're not going to give them the treatment, because I've never heard anything said yet about how these people are transitioning out of the program. I've heard about cost, I heard about they're still housed, but are these people going to be forever dependent upon the state, <clears throat> dependent upon the war? I think we need to look at what does success look like. Let us define success Thank for you. Federal Way. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, the hour is getting a little bit late, so when, when the red goes off, please, within with a sentence or two, please uh, conclude your remarks. Uh, the last six, uh, Dara Mandeville, um, uh, Melinda Ruiz, um, uh, Maju, um, uh, Maju uh, Qureshi, uh, Vitali uh, Picotin, uh, Trinice Rogers, and uh, Stephen McNeil. Uh, Dara. Mayor Council, thank you so much for your time. Everybody has great things written out and I just have random questions scribbled down. So I'm gonna try my best. Um, one thing that's been touched on a couple thing, a couple times tonight, I'm not sure if everybody in this room knows, but the latest count in Federal Way School District is there are 1,600 students who are homeless. Students, okay. I really hate sitting here tonight. I had it all written out. And the one thing that really bothers me about this conversation is everything comes back to us versus them. The people that are for this and the people that are against this. I find myself in the against this camp. Here's why. Accountability. Since when is accountability not a thing? Oh, sorry. I Actually, don't... Uh, Derek, can you hold on for a second? Yeah. Let's, let's clear that screen. Can you... Um... We don't need Pause to see or, me. Can you, can you roll it back a bit? <laughs> it's really okay. Just restart it. Slide back. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where are we at time-wise? Could, could you pause it? It's fine. Oh, I don't. I don't know. Okay. Go ahead, Derek. Accountability. I think that everybody in this room who is in the against camp, if it, if, if mandatory substance abuse treatment was part of this deal, I think we'd all go home. I do. I do, because we don't hate homeless people. We don't. We're out in these camps all the time, picking up their garbage, talking to them, dealing with them. We have so much compassion. But they, they need to be held accountable. My three adult children, well, children, they're grown-ups, but they're killing themselves to support themselves in our city. All of them, some work in the city, can't even live here. But anyway... <laughs> 
why can't treatment be mandatory? That's all. And if there's not a problem, if, if it's just homelessness, great. Give them a room. Another question, how does King County plan on supplementing our 911 services that are obviously going to increase with no tax income from that property? Can there be a community oversight committee? Why not? This is a new thing. Um, and, and a couple things that were brought up tonight um, that, that kind of struck me is, um, Mario did a great job of explaining everything, but um, every time somebody from the council brought up, what is the success rate? What is your success rate? It just caught tiptoed around and nobody answered the question. I personally, as a business owner and homeowner in Federway, I don't give a crap about health through housing success rate. What about Urban League? What is their success rate? Because that's who's running this program in my city. Uh, that's what I want to know. So I'd like that question answered. Um, and then it was also mentioned that folks will be encouraged to participate in the wraparound services they're going to offer. What if they don't? It's not mandatory. Then what? Is there a time frame? Uh, just there's so much to this. And again, I'm not against the homeless. I want everybody to have a great life. This is America. But for the love of all things holy, we've got to have some accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> Melinda Ruiz. Hello, my name is Melinda Ruiz. And um, good evening, Mayor Farrell and Federway City Council and community as well. Um, mine is going to be a little bit different than everybody else's, so um, just hold tight on that. <laughs> um, I have lived in Federway for all but two years of my life. And I went to elementary school at Adelaide, then went to Lakota, and then went to Federway High School. And my husband and I raised our three children who all went to all three of these schools. Um, I have always been um, involved in Federway and just want to thank the city as my husband and I will be retiring and moving to Arizona. So this will be my last council meeting. Um, so we will be leaving April 1st, uh, April Fool's Day. <laughs> That's no joke. Um, I'm excited as the, what's going on in Federal Way and the new businesses that are coming here. Um, I thank the economic development team for all the new businesses that we're getting here. And there is, there is a lot if you look down the street. Um, we will back, be back to visit and I will miss the city and all of the people that I've met over the years. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing the changes in City Federal, City of Federway over the next few years. Thanks, Melinda. She was also a great, she's also a great neighbor. We lived next door to each other for years and years, so we're gonna miss you. Um, Maju uh, Kurishi? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. It's Major Qureshi. Um, good evening, Mayor Farrell and members of the council as well as community. I um, have been a Federal Way resident for the last 15 years and I have spent the last 10 years working at the Multi-Service Center, which is a community-based organization right down the street. And I wanted to share with you this evening some success from our permanent supportive housing program here in Federal Way called the William J. Wood Veterans House. It opened in 2016. So it's, a bit, it's been about eight years now. And I wanted to share some of the enrichment activities that we've been able to include at that site that has contributed to the resident well-being over a period of time. The site, William J. Wood Veterans House, um, is serving chronically homeless veterans and their families. There are 44 units of housing at that location. And throughout the years, in response to the residents and what they would like to work on, we've been able to add things like a gardening club, a walking club. Uh, they've also participated in Sacoma Lanes Bowling League, and they won two years in a row. And we feel that integrating these residents into the community is really critical for their well-being. And we do tend to see a reduction of their use in substances when they are exposed to positive relationships, when they are being accepted by a community. It does take time, but our um, case managers 
a work in partnership with the VA clinical staff. So it is a it is a holistic model that's being used. And our case managers come from back, backgrounds that are either veterans or formerly homeless themselves. And so once they build trust with our residents, um, then they're able to work through the barriers and help them be um, self-sufficient and honestly thrive in the community. Um, some of the residents have formed their own tenant council. Uh, there, there are community meetings that we have on a monthly basis, um, as well as uh, enrichment activities are provided to the kids as well. So thank you, and that is all I'll be sharing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Vitaly Picatin. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council, and uh, community of Federal Way. And first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude as a representative of Ukrainian community. Uh, and uh, for the last two years, we accepted many refugees who became, as the Council Train said, uh, homeless people just because of the war. So I'd like to express uh, support from the mayor and from our community to our Ukrainian refugees. Thank you. And uh, based on that, uh, I would like to experience myself as a father of five kids and uh, as a chaplain during this uh, last two difficult years in the country where I was born in Ukraine. We've been traveling with my wife and we've been serving for wounded, for orphans, for widows for people who lost their homes uh, in thousands of numbers. Uh, so I learned a word of compassion and we started a ministry called Servants of Compassion. Just uh, today I met a young man on our streets of a city of Federal Way and uh, just by his look I recognized myself when I was drug addicted and I stopped him and asked his name. He said his name is Black Maybe you met him on 320 with a big chain, a metal chain, and a very strange look. So I prayed for him and talked to him. And just because of compassion, I think everyone is here. And I'm grateful for Pastor who mentioned the first definition that we are a human being, but we have a soul. And the people who are hurt by life, by circumstances, their soul is hurt. So this means there's uh, issues, mental health issues, or we call it spiritually as a Christian, I'm not ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. So I can say they need the salvation. They need something spiritual to be built up, you know? Because personally working with my kids and uh, I trying to be example for them and lead them by example. And personally as our family, we're working in our Slavic community and we help more than 20 uh, young guys. We send them to rehab centers. So for every problem, mental health issues, there is an issue which needs to be resolved. And I'm grateful for the questions that we raised, accountability and result. Where are we going to lead those people that are going to be living there? What are we going to offer them? Are we just offering them just physical help? How about the spiritual help? Other churches, local churches, will be able to enter, to have communication. Are they going to be allowed to serve them? Because personally, I am ready, and that's what we do. So we're praying for our city, we're praying for our government, and we're praying for the people who need help as <clears throat> drug addicted and homeless people. So we need to remember that they need God, number one, and that's what we're losing as a nation, as a country, and uh, so let's start praying. This is what I'm begging you, and b have a faith. Thank you. And can I share a small example? I, I, we're really past the three, th three minutes. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for your time. You. God bless America. God bless City of Federal Way. Thank you. Trinice Rogers, and then Stephen McNeil. Hello, excuse me, I'm dressed down today, I apologize, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on speaking. I just wanted to thank this brother for just speaking Jesus Christ to this, and bringing Jesus Christ to this space, because a lot of things can be done easily if we just choose to lead with love. You know, choosing to lead with love is going to, is going to require Jesus. And so with that, I did have something prepared to speak on. 
um, I was actually replacing my child's um, cell phone and our local Verizon listening to this meeting via Zoom when the gentleman that was supporting us was over, he was listening, actually listening into our meeting. And he was asking, what are you listening to? I'm listening to the city council meeting. He is a resident, he's a long time resident of Auburn. And as we were talking, he, I overheard, um, thank you Urban League for being here, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for <laughs> sitting through this interrogation. I wanna apologize as a resident, I apologize. Um, he was listening in and he was essentially saying that, um, I live in Auburn and we heard um, Urban City, he said, this is just literally before I came here, he was sharing out, we had a homeless issue in Auburn. And he starts sharing how awful it was. And he, he said, um, a matter of two years ago, two years ago was when change happened. And he said, we don't have that issue anymore. And he started identifying the spaces and areas where there were profound issues. And as we were listening in, it sounded like Urban League was, had started engaging the city of Auburn two years ago. So when we talk about, I've heard multiple people ask about the success rate, right, of Urban League. I'm here to present and share out there is success rate in Auburn. If it can work for Auburn, it can work for a federal way. And as we move forward, I do choose to leave in the lead with compassion and love. And I understand that there are spaces where people need to be supported. And I understand there are spaces where we have to meet people where they are. Um, my family, my husband, my children, we, we hand out hot meals. We have for over five years to the homeless community. We have been hands on. We've seen, we've seen the things that you know, the community's talking about. We hand out Christmas bags every year for the, over the past five years. This last time, my children were like, Mom, the mayor should come with us next time. I said, yeah, that would be great. Well, we're talking about leading and, and understanding the severity. It's not, and not every person we encountered had drug issues. Some people were just downright hungry and homeless. And I can understand, I've never used drugs, I've never used marijuana, I'm not a drug user, but I can understand pain. And these people are essentially in pain. And if we just choose to lead with love, I think we can go a long way. Thank you. Thanks, Trudice. Okay, the last pink sheet I have is uh, Stephen McNeil. Mr. McNeil. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you. Um, in our community. My name is Stephan McNeil. Um, I moved here uh, in 2001, my wife and I, to be a part of a, a church outreach program here in Federal Way. Uh, subsequently, I opened up an all-state insurance agency built and sold that. We raised six kids here. We now have six grandkids here as well in this community. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur. I've always volunteered and got involved in the community, be part of a solution, not necessarily uh, somebody throwing rocks at something in terms of conversation, hitting the window and just making noise, but really trying to be in the trenches to help. So uh, my background uh, from this in this inner city of Chicago, my father owned back gambling houses and taverns. I OD'd in eighth grade on PCP. I kicked out of the house in eighth grade, stopped my mother from getting beat up. Um, God has merely just cleaned me up. What you see today is not the guy that... Um, that really um, that grew up in a different environment. I've always had a heart to help homeless and help people because I had so much help growing up. Um, but I've, I've learned that from my background when I finished school playing football, I worked in corrections in the for the state of Iowa and I did chronic substance abuse counseling. I almost got fired twice because I was using the state mandated programs for drug um, addiction that wasn't working. And I realized I knew what would help people. And so I would talk about the gospel. I would talk about a change of heart. They get this head knowledge of what they should and should not do, but it doesn't transfer to the heart. So when they leave a controlled environment, they go back to their homies where they can't get a job and they go back to the drugs. Not all cases, but what I've seen. And so I've had to learn a balance. I've been feeding the homeless, leading the team that feeds the homeless a hot meal every Friday night since 2008. What I see now, the homelessness has changed dramatically. It's a totally different population. It's not the population that I moved here and I see. I see more people here now that are straight up bloat. They're trying to make a decision when I'm giving them a hot meal, I'm gonna keep hitting this pipe or I'm gonna take your meal. So when you say there's gonna be another 1,600 uh, beds in this community 
Well, 50% of most homeless people have a drug issue. Uh, the recidivism rate that I experienced in the 90s was over 80%. They have drugs now that are more addictive than ever before. And that's what you see in our community. And for the entrepreneurial side of me, and I speak to the council, is this. When businesses are looking and they do people to come out and forecast and look at the community before they have an official walk through, they see the community. And they make a decision, we're going to bring their business here or take it to another community. There's a reason why Bellevue said no. There's a reason why they said no. We have to understand that we have to balance what needs to happen, not just throw money at it. Money becomes nothing more than fertilizer when the government gets involved for more problems. Brings about SECs, syringe exchange programs and projects. How many times have you seen those companies, I mean those projects in other communities around the country? Look at the results. Not, not your, what your heart is at, but really look at the results. A lot of us have grandkids and kids that are, that are still in this community. I do. And I know a lot of you do as well. Our community is changing. And we, we have to make decisions by looking at results first. I think the solution is churches being involved more than government because the government simply doesn't get it right. There's too many favors they get, too many hands they got to make sure they wash and um, in favor. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, uh, I understand uh, our, our deputy city clerk uh, has informed me there is somebody online uh, who wishes to speak. Is that correct? Correct. Mr. Larry Nordberg. Okay. Is there anyone else? No. All right. Mr. Nordberg, are you online? Hello? Larry? Should be. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, I was born and raised in Federal Way. Um, I've been a realtor in Federal Way for the last uh, 40 years. And before that, my father was a realtor in Federal Way. Um, I got to tell you that uh, I think that I'm on the uh, negative side of this for some reasons. And I think that drug testing should be tested daily or at least very often per week on a random basis. Um, I think it's going to be very bad for the real estate values in federal way. Um, I got a question, how many people does uh, this program grow the government? And uh, will the city of the city council, the federal way, will they vote on this or is this just a, an informative session? Um, why did Bellevue, is another question, why did Bellevue reject this plan? Does anybody know? Uh, Mr. Norberg, go, go ahead and just finish your comments and then we'll, uh, we'll answer yep. those when you're done. And then uh, why, would, uh, why would they be allowed to use drugs in the, in the room? I mean, can't, can't there be rules? And if they, you know, disobey those rules, maybe, you know, send them to uh, a facility. And if that doesn't work, then, you know, I don't know, maybe uh, they can build a new facility on McNeil Island and have vocational programs for these people <laughs> and some kind of treatment center until they get well enough to come back. Um, you know, I don't understand. Can we just send them back to Bill Gates's neighborhood? And uh, that's, I guess that's the majority of my question other than, you know, this was on the tax rules and now it's not. Is the 5% per year uh, built in or baked in as she said? And uh, or is that every five year? 5% seems pretty high.
And that's all of my questions for right now. All right, thank you, Larry. I can tell you um, uh, that the, the council will not vote on this. This was property that was acquired by King County. Uh, this is an informational session uh, where uh, they have provided the information and obviously we're going to ask them to come back here in a few minutes um, uh, momentarily. Um, this we did the council did add licensure requirements uh, as we have mentioned uh, previously and uh, there will be a code of conduct. Uh, with that, um, our folks with uh, uh, we've got uh, Kelly Wrighty, Mario Williams Sweet, uh, Keani uh, Tieski and Drew Zimmerman. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, hopefully uh, you were uh, kind of keeping score a little bit in regard to uh, some of the questions. Kelly, would you like to go first in regard to uh, answering some of the questions? Sure. Happy to, uh, Mr. Mayor, and would appreciate your and the Council's help in uh, touching on any of the issues that I perhaps didn't capture. Um, I did hear a note at the beginning uh, about wanting to make sure that we could have a name. Um, all of our health through housing programs do have to have a name for each of the building. And so uh, while I know that that was one of the more minor uh, questions, we will be making sure that we name the building uh, and working with the Urban League to be able to do that. Um, I heard a lot of questions about um, use uh, of substances on the property uh, as well as the challenges of fentanyl. Uh, right now in the community, I'll share a couple of different things. Uh, one, I do just want to remind folks, um, everybody in uh, this building that is residents in this building still will be uh, in um, accordance with all applicable laws. Um, so in the same way that when I am in my home, um, the laws of the state and of the city that I live in still apply. Uh, the laws of the, um, f the city of Federal Way and the state of Washington will still apply to these folks. Uh, what we are saying is that it will not be the Urban League's job to enforce laws within uh, the, the doors of the buildings uh, that we have um, because these are complying with Washington tenant law. Um, and all of the other applicable laws. As you note, Mr. Mayor, uh, we are uh, therefore complying with the Federal Way Code that has required us to submit uh, the Good Neighbor Agreement, the Code of Conduct, and all of those applicable requirements. Um, the other thing that I will note, in uh, consistent with folks' interest in making sure that more behavioral health treatment is available, uh, the county does now have a crisis care centers uh, program that will be standing up urgent care for folks in need of behavioral health treatment. Um, and so over the next few years, we will be citing something specifically in South King County. We don't have a site yet um, that will have both a 24 hour urgent care for folks in need of both substance use and mental health, uh, as well as an observation unit for folks who need care for 23 hours and extended stay uh, of up to 14 days. So we are absolutely seeing this health through housing program as one component of caring for community and recognize that there is a lot more that needs to be done to support our community's substance use disorder and mental health needs. Uh, as part of that, the county did release a couple of weeks ago 13 different strategies that we are deploying right now in response to the region's fentanyl and other opioid use disorders. Um, and so we are continuing to implement those. In addition to our crisis care centers, we are currently uh, acquiring more mobile crisis teams that will be able to be on site across the county to be responsive to folks' urgent uh, mental health and substance use needs. Uh, we are expanding fentanyl testing as well as access to Narcan. Um, and there is now a, um, a phone number essentially that you can call uh, to be able to access one of the top uh, prescriptions for folks who have substance use disorder and particularly for fentanyl use, uh, buprenorphine. So um, we're happy to follow up with the city council to show you all of those other strategies that we are using to be able to support the community's substance use disorder needs. Um, I heard some requests for more stories of success and particularly Urban League. So I will um, ask the Urban League if they wanna share some of that. And I will also share our uh, data dashboard and our last annual report on the Health Through Housing program. Uh, I heard requests about the parking lot um, and sorry for moving pretty quick. Um, so please let me know if you want me to slow down uh, or shorten up. Um, but I wanna make sure that folks feel heard um, and know that we are tracking your questions as they come in. Uh, I heard a question about the parking lot. Um, so I wanna remind folks that there is a fence around the parking lot. Uh, we have seen uh, various permanent supportive housing across the region that do not have a fence, um, but for our 
startup operations, we will continue to use the fence and then be able to work with the city of Federal Way to understand what's best for your land use, for um, the needs of the community. So for uh, all intents and purposes for us, uh, the fence uh, will stay uh, because we believe that it helps with access to the building as well as for the neighborhood. Um, I heard some questions about shelter referral and length of stay that I uh, committed to get back to you all on, and I heard continued uh, requests for more support for youth um, and understanding what we're doing um, in coordination with partners like Fusion, like Mary's Place, um, and so I can follow up on that as well. Um, I heard some questions about um, the model of health through housing, and I just wanna uh, remind folks the reason that we bought buildings like the extended stay here in Federal Way, if you go back to 2020, uh, we had congregate shelters across uh, the county, really, um, where folks were sleeping six inches apart. And what we knew was that actually isn't a healthy place uh, for folks to be able to sleep at night and be able to get enough rest to go out to their jobs, to be able to access behavioral health treatment, uh, and be able to access housing stability. And so the reason that we have bought these hotels um, is to make sure that folks have stronger access to connection to treatment. Um, there is a lot of data that we, connect, uh, that we tracked throughout the uh, early stages of the COVID pandemic response, trying to understand what happens when folks get um, a room. And one of the stories uh, that I can tell you is the story of uh, a man who uh, was staying at a shelter, like I said, six stitches apart on a mat this thin. Um, and when he moved into a building that we had uh, under the pandemic response, when he got a door, when he got a bathroom, when he no longer had to worry that his stuff was gonna get stolen in the middle of the night, as I heard one of the uh, residents comment on, uh, the case managers who had been working with him for years said, I didn't recognize him when he walked by. Um, so I totally understand and appreciate um, the concerns that folks are bringing, the questions that can, people uh, continue to have, um, and I wanna make sure that you know that we hear you at King County, um, that we will continue to partner with the Urban League through our Good Neighbor Agreement to set up regular community meetings uh, to be able to share with you updates on our ongoing operations um, and be able to have this continued exchange of ideas. This is not the last time we're gonna have this conversation, um, but we welcome more questions uh, and we will be sure to follow up with some more information. Um, anything that you feel like I missed and otherwise I can turn it over to Urban League to see if they've got some stories. Hey, let's let's talk to, uh, yes, let's turn it over to the Urban League and we're, we're two hours uh, two hours plus into this and we do have some more business on the agenda. So, uh, but uh, please, Kiana. Thank you everybody for having us once again. Um, I do wanna give a success. Um, I'll give a success on prevention of homelessness. We were able to uh, work a po program, it was called Home Base. It was in April of 2019, and it went to December of 2019. Well, yeah, 2019. It helped South King County, and Federal Way was over, we had, we helped over 605 individuals, which included households. It had children, families that were prevented from um, homelessness because we prevented eviction. They had to have, um, basically they had to have a, a siphon or from the court. And those families were able to get funding and stay in their homes. So that's one of the successes and um, Federal Way was over half of those people. Um, we have another success that we have, I told you about our King's Inn program that we had for six months. We took them from, straight from the encampments and um, they were be able to be housed in the permanent supportive housing all over King County. Um, we had 36 of them move into a place that we have in West Seattle that we are, we have them there now, it's permanent supportive housing. And I'm not gonna say that we can just wave a wand and and they're not gonna do drugs there. But from my experience, is seeing those that came from the streets, some of them had a hard time being in a place that they had their own shower, their own bath, because they were so used to being out in the streets. But just seeing them, you could see the difference. And even if they did use drugs, they see the community, they see there's help, they see their friend getting help. They're asking questions. We have a substance use counselor that comes every other week. 
and the success rate of them wanting to go get, um, sorry you guys, I'm, I'm not used to being in this setting, but <laughs> this is just my work. And I'm not just saying this because I have a team that does it. I'm saying this because I've been a part of my team. I was doing hours a day, hours all working up from six o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock at night, making sure everybody was housed in from the encampment because first of all, the encampment was caught on fire and we had no choice. So <laughs> that's, I'm just saying like, and another thing is that my mom, she stays in Uptown Square. She's one that, she talks to me every day. She's like, can I help? Can I help you support? I'm glad that the place is going to be there because she walks to the store every day. She talks to the people that are out there. She sees the young people. She sees the people that, that are hungry. They're, they don't want, they're, they're ashamed. But the reason why they're ashamed is because, like, they, they don't trust anybody. But us being there, we're going to be supportive. We're going to be paying attention to them. We're gonna say, have you seen this person this day? It's not like we're gonna just have them sitting in a room because that's gonna be accountable in our hearts that they're not gonna, but it's gonna be like a community, just so you guys know. It's not just gonna be something that we're throwing somebody in a room, letting them get high, and we don't know what's happening. So. Kiana, thank you. Um, appreciate it. I think, um, I think we're about two and a half hours in. Was there anything you need? Is there anything else that you wanted to say? On, on I do want to thank um, everybody involved. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being uh, good listeners and providing uh, the. And this is the, the the beginning of a dialogue. We appreciate that. I think people recognize that. And I want to say on behalf of the people of Federal Way, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think, Council, I think we're going to need about a five-minute break, but please, let's keep it to five minutes. We will uh, reconvene at um, uh, uh, 926, sharp. Good idea.
We're going to reconvene. Order. Apparently, no one's paying attention to you. They're about to. <laughs> okay. Where's Lydia? Lydia's right there. Oh, that's right. Okay. And then. Um, <laughs> Hey, sir. You were not. You were not. You were not. Thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very impassioned. Very good. I'm coming Dash Point Road. Yeah, yeah. Dash Point down in Nazarene. We're going to see each other Thursday. Yeah, we will. That's right. All right. Well, Thank you. you Thanks again. Awesome, yeah. I'll let you guys Thank you very much. God okay. You Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, everybody, we're, uh, we're on item six. This is Council Committee and Regional Committee's report. Parks, Recreations, uh, Public Safety Commission, um, uh, uh, Public Safety Committee, Councilmember Walsh. All right. Um, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, this month we have not had a, uh, a meeting since we would have been scheduled. We were in D.C. last week. Our next meeting will be uh, uh, April 9th. I will actually not be there, and uh, uh, Councilmember Jack Dovey will be chairing that meeting. I may or may not be joining remotely. Uh, another big event in April. April 20th is the annual Parks Appreciation Day. And so hopefully we will have a wonderful big turnout for it. Um, we've had as many in years past, we've had hundreds out for it. Hopefully we can have hundreds out for it again. And, uh, and my only other comment is since, uh, you know, some of the things we've been discussing falls under uh, human services, I have some serious concerns about how it will be and the success of it, serious concerns about the sex, success, and I hope that I am totally wrong and that it is wildly successful. So anyway. Very good. Thank you very much. That's my report. Thank you. Land Use and Transportation, LUTC, Councilmember Dovey. Yeah, April 1 will be our <clears throat> next meeting here at uh, 5 o'clock. And it's not April Fool's Day. It's the day we get a lot of land use done. All right. Thank you very much. Finance, Economic Development, Regional Affairs Committee, Councilmember Tran. Um, our next meeting is going to be March 26th at 5 p.m. in this room. Thank you. Very good. Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, Councilmember Lydia Sefados. Thank you, Mayor, and I have nothing to report on. All right, thank you. Regional uh, Committee's report, Councilmember Honda. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind Council that on <clears throat> excuse me, April 11th, AWC is having a legislative session recap. You need to register online. It's 12 to 1.15 p.m. Also, on AWC is having an Ethics 101 uh, local decision making and ethics essential class. It's second of, second of a series of seven classes and workshops. It's March 21st from 12 to 1.15, and you do need to pre register for that also. Um, today, I attended the skateboard meeting, and it was our third meeting in person since COVID. We met at SeaTac City Hall like we used to. And there are a couple things I want to talk about. One is we had a long discussion on uh, fan pools. And so King County has a program where if five interested people who are going to about the same location, uh, they can get a van to, uh, they need a volunteer driver, uh, but the King County pays for gas and insurance and um, you can get to work that way or to school that way. If you want more information, let me know, or you can look it up in, in, under King County. 
This is also Transit Appreciation Week, so if you use transit, you can thank your drivers. Um, <coughs> but what I wanted to bring to the public's attention is that um, Metro is forming a mobility board for South King County. And I'm going to ask Amy to put this on our Facebook page, this information. The mobility board is um, looking for how we will plan for the future with light rail coming into this area. And it's not just for Federal Way, but it's for the South King County cities. And it is a, uh, you can actually be paid to be on the board. Um, you need to apply by May 10th. And um, they're all, they also have a survey out on your transit needs in this area. And that is, deadline is on May 10th. I'll, we'll put that up. And they're having community engagement sessions on April 3rd at noon, April 21st at 10.30 a.m. and May 6th at 6 p.m. Um, I would say Metro really does want to get our opinion on transit and how transit is going to be impacted by light rail. So um, I will get that information up so that um, folks can see what's going on. And I have a lot more, but you know, it's been a long night, long night so. All right, thank you. Council President Kochmar. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, I had asked Tanya to make a little presentation tonight about how lobbying works, but it's so late, maybe we'll do it another time. Uh, I just had a meeting this morning. Actually, I was asked to speak at a civics and government class for third graders in Wildwood. And um, they wanted to know if we did town hall meetings. And I said, yes, we just had one at Olympic View. And they said, wait a minute, Olympic View? So I promised them that I would ask the mayor to have the next town hall meeting at Wildwood Elementary School. It's a great idea. I was actually thinking about it. It's a brand new, brand new brand school. New school. It's on the other, other side of the side. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And they're very interested. A wonderful, wonderful school. Yeah, it really is. And <laughs> okay. It's been a few years since we've had one right there. And they have a third grade class who talks about civics and government. That's great. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so David, um, let's, uh, let's put Wildwood Elementary School <laughs> next up in the queue, okay. on deck. Um, okay, um, thank you everybody. The item seven, consent agenda. Uh, these are items that have gone through uh, committee, can be approved all at once and, and uh, council knows. Uh, item A, minutes for the March 5, 2024 special and regular meeting minutes. Item B, uh, the South 288th Street Road Diet Phase 280%, design report and bid authorization. C, approval to submit NPDES annual report and D, interlocal agreement with King County for the use of the regional stormwater decant facility. Council, are there any items on, the, on that list that you would want to be pulled for separate consideration? Okay. Uh, Council President Coachmark. Thank you, Mayor. I move approval of the items A through D on the consent agenda. Second. It's been a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Matters passed unanimously. All right. Uh, item 8, Council Business. Uh, item A is the 2024 City Council Goals. Uh, this is a follow-up not only from the retreat, uh, but also from the last uh, council meeting um, at the council request. Our city administrator, Brian Davis, will make the presentation. All right, thank you, Mayor and, and members of the council. Good evening. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, this is a follow-up from your last meeting where you discussed uh, updates to the goals. Um, it was not up for action, and so tonight it is up for action. So by way of review, uh, the revised vision statement um, that was discussed at the last meeting was as a fast-growing health care innovation hub fitter way offers an ideal lifestyle for families and businesses the goals uh, one through four were discussed at the meeting uh, that those being sustainable revenue public safety uh, health care innovation becoming a health care innovation hub homelessness and then since the discussion at the last meeting there was a request uh, from a citizen to add uh, airport issues as a goal uh, the mayor is supportive of that and that is in his recommendation to include that as a fifth goal for your consideration and the options are to approve these as the vision statement and goals as presented or to um, uh, not approve them provide additional direction and as i mentioned the oops let's see i hit the wrong arrow as i mentioned the Mayor's recommendation is the first option, which is to approve them as presented. So I let me go back to the slide that has the 
goals for your consideration and your discussion at this time. Okay, Councilmember Dovey, then Councilmember Seven Dawson. Yeah, um, I'm generally in support of these goals. The only question I have is we're going to vote on these, and number five came in, and the council hasn't discussed it. Um, I could see putting that as a, a sub goal under land use, maybe under you know, the 2030 vision or somewhere in there, but I, mean, I don't feel comfortable, although I support us really being active in the airport and making sure we do everything, to just have this sprung tonight and vote on number five, I'd rather have some discussion and add it or make sure that that's really the goal. Um, because I could be a citizen and say, hey, I want more turf fields, and all of a sudden it shows up here and we vote on it and we haven't discussed it. So my my only point is I agree with this, I want to support it, but I think we have a, need a little bit more discussion on number five to make it codified in our rules. Thank you. Point well taken, Council and uh, a council member, and uh, we can always just pass if the, whoever makes the motion um, to just uh, approve uh, one through four. I'll leave it to Council to decide that. Council member Sefa Dawson? Yeah, number four, um, developing a plan to address homelessness, drug addiction. I think we're too specific with a drug addiction. And so adding mental health, and um, I, I sent you an email this morning about that too. So um, I think we should be a little um, huh. broader maybe. So is no. it, would you make a motion? Are you making a motion? So um, so just adding, um, oh shoot, let me. Well, council, are, council member, are yes. you making I, a motion to add? Oh, well, no, it's a discussion, so. Okay. Well, we, we can make the motion make the to motion. include you, you that. You make the motion to amend, then we could have the discussion. Oh, yeah. Uh, is that your? Well, there's no motion so. yet. Okay. So well, we, we could just include okay, it. Okay, let hold on just for a second. C Council Member uh, Bonda. Thank you. So when we were in, uh, at NLC, the three of us sat at a table and spoke with a woman <coughs> from some other state. I can't remember about what we were talking to about tonight, and <coughs> she mentioned that drugs are certainly an issue. But alcoholism is, is a greater issue that they're facing in their um, homeless um, situations. So I would just put addiction, not specifically drug addiction. Okay, so Actually, council, is there general consensus? Actually, council member, it, would your motion be to remove, do you agree that you, uh, just to add? Addiction. addiction. Actually, this is what I wrote down, to address, home, um, address homelessness, addiction, mental health, and related issues. Is that your motion? Yes. Mental health. Okay. Yes. There's been a motion on the floor. Is there a second to amend item four? Second. 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 There's been a motion and a second to amend item four. Uh, our, our city clerk, uh, do you have that, have you captured that language? I didn't hear the final. Okay. Would you maybe say it just a little bit slower? Sure. Please. <laughs> okay. So, oh, where is it? The full. What is your motion? Yeah, I wanted to see, say the oh. whole thing, but I don't At see it. Oh, okay. Uh, homelessness, mental health. No, hope, me, homelessness, addiction, mental health, and related issues. And oh, related you, issues. That's the part. It's I not just drug. It's addiction and related issues. Okay. Yeah. So, does that make? Who's sense? typing? Brian. Somebody. Oh, Brian is. Okay. So on the screen right now, Brian, you want to read it? Develop a plan to address homelessness, mental health, addiction, and related issues. Yeah. Okay. Does that capture it? Yes. There's been a motion and a second. Was there a second to that motion? Yes. There's been a motion and a second to amend item number four. Uh, is there any discussion on that point? Yeah, d just a, a minor thing. I, I think it would read a lot better if it developed a plan to address homelessness, homelessness, addiction, mental health, and related Wait. issues. Just put addiction before Addiction mental first. Health. Is that a, so would you it. consider that a friendly amendment? That's how I have it, actually. Okay. Initially. So do you have that, <laughs> uh, Brian? Why don't we get that? Do you have that? Yep. yep. Okay. Just the way it says now. We'll take that as a friendly amendment. The mover of the motion has agreed. Um, uh, I've, I've called for any any other uh, um, discussion on that point. All right. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The matter passes unanimously. Council, what is your pleasure with regard to item number five? So, uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Council Member Stephan Dawson? Yeah. So, um, actually, I did not bring my notes from the, from the conference, but there was a lot of discussion around FAA and, and the changes that are happening. So, I think we need to be on top of that and i know there's been community members like uh, marine hills and um, areas that have been very involved and actively following and tracking what's going on with the airport and also 
Highline Forum and all the other, um, what is it, um, the other ones, you know, all the different activities that Federal has been actively involved in, I think um, keep, um, adding that to our goals would be beneficial to our city and also would help us be part of um, Southland County's and airport, what are, what are they called, airport neighbors, neighboring cities um, should stay engaged and involved in it. So adding it to me would be great. And council, I have to personally apologize. I know that we were there at the retreat. This was something that uh, Dave Berger, one of our residents, had mm -hmm. had forwarded. Um, I, you know, I thought it would, uh, you know. So obviously, these need to be thought out. So uh, uh, whatever whatever your pleasure is on on this point, I, what we'll do is we'll just go right in order. Council member, um, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's that chair. I, it I'm is the chair. That exactly. It's a hot sock. Yeah. Exactly. Dang it. Um. Councilor Mc... It is late, though. It Councilor is. McDaniel, Councilor Rahonda, and then uh, back to uh, Councilmember um, Dovey. All right. Um, I'm in agreement with uh, the kind of the concept both the council members have. I'd like to see it actually go to like uh, LTAC and for compensation, maybe if that's a possibility. I'm not sure what the requirement was. Um, like I said, I don't like the last minute throw it in there yep. uh, without having an open conversation about it. But I don't have a problem with what they have going on. I just want to have it open for discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Rohanda. Uh, I agree. We should discuss it before we add it to the council goals. But I would remind you, Mayor, that you had a commission that met on this, and they have written a report. That's right. So That's this, why, is, yeah. this is something we've studied um, extensively as a council. And I do think we need to continue being involved in it and being informed on what's going on. Things are picking up at the airport, and uh, other cities are very informed, and we need to continue to be informed. Well, and, and you know, Bill has been continuously involved in this process. We provide Correct. updates, uh, you know, and so it's something we are engaged in. I think that's why uh, there is a long. I mean, we've been involved in this for ten years. Right. Um, so. Yeah, exactly. Thirty years, uh, but these are council goals that are discrete. Council Member Dovey. Yeah, uh, my only comment is I think this is a very crucial thing that we should weigh in. And I mean, last time we had this fight, it was millions of dollars, and you know everybody got everything, and Federal Way fought it, and none of all the sounding uh, rehabs or anything got to Federal Way. So I think it's really important. That we do it. I just my pra my practice says it should go to the committee, hear it, make sure we all agree, and then bring it back to the council. I would I would guess that everybody on this council would probably vote yes, we should do it. Okay. But I don't want to start the precedent that we just legislate from the dais on the first time we see it. Hear that. Thank you, Councilor Walsh. Yeah, and and and, and I agree with that also. Uh, one thing that I think that would be well is is uh, some of the who have not been on the council for decades. Uh, we could probably use a refresher and an update on the full uh, thing with the airport, right? And uh, so that we're so that we're uh, um, you know full, fully updated, aware, and can make wise decisions on it. Very good. And I'm informed it will be on the next LUTC agenda. All right. Very good. <laughs> And let's uh, thank you. And let's also, uh, Bill, thank you so much for all the work you've done over the years um, on this issue. Let's also bring that, uh, just as a matter, the same presentation or maybe even an updated one to a, a an upcoming city council meeting. Yes. Um, I think that's for the whole community and everybody. So the presentation that's given at LUTC will be provided. Uh, Jennifer, if you could note that for agenda setting, uh, we'll pick, either, if it's not the next meeting, then the following meeting. Um, so I, I will counsel, I will withdraw my recommendation in, with regard to item five that will leave uh, items one through four. Um, and uh, I don't see any other, oh, Council Member Sepadasan, I see your light Oh, on. no, I forgot my light, but I do stand corrected. Yes, let's remove it for now and discuss it. So. Very good. It remains ongoing work that we do, and it's a, it's a commitment uh, to our community and to the residents in Marine Hills. This was something that, just to make sure it's clear, uh, that this is something that we're very committed to, we're working on it, uh, but th these goals were the product not only of a retreat four years ago, uh, but the retreat this year, um, and um, this is ongoing work, but we can always, we're, we're continuing to work toward it, and even if it's not in our goals, uh, that, that will not affect the, the amount of work and our commitment. Councilmember Member Honda? Um, when we talk about airport issues, often we only bring up the Marine Hills neighborhood. Yep. It affects... Oh, 
so many other neighborhoods, not just Marine Hills. Clearly. So, yes. Thank you. At the town hall meeting, thank you. I, you're absolutely right. Quite, in fact, for those individuals, I, the, the, I think the entire council was at the town hall meeting, and the uh, the plane turns, uh, you know, essentially right over that area. So it does affect areas, uh, many other areas, other than Marine Hills. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Council President, do you have a motion with respect to items one through four? I move approval of items one through four as amended. Second. Okay, there's a motion, a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, uh, one through four are adopted. Thank you, Brian, very much for your help with that. All right, next, item B, 2023 Consolidated Annual Performance and Eva Evaluation Report, also known as, or AKA, CAPER. Uh, we've got a presentation from Sarah Bridgeford, our Community Services Manager. Good evening. Um, let me open presentation. I've done this how many times over the years and still struggle sometimes. Okay. There it is. Mayor, if I might make a clarification on the on the previous motion on the yeah. previous item, I, in in the agenda, I believe the item was to approve both the vision statement as well as the goals. But the motion that was actually made was specific to the goals only. Uh, I assume that that was meant to include the vision statement as well in the in the motion and approval. Um, Council President, is that correct? The the vision. Yeah. Okay. I think is there consensus among the council uh, that the vision was included in that? Uh, that the uh, the action item included the vision uh, plus the four items. All right, uh, seeing a consensus, I, that was my understanding, but thank you very much for clarifying. All right, okay. Tara. Good evening, Mayor Farrell, Council President Kochmar, and members of the Council. Uh, this evening, I'm going to be presenting our 2023 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report also known as the CAPER. This is specifically pertaining to HUD funding for the Community Development Block Grant Program. The policy question before you is should City Council approve the 2023 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, CAPER? Um, this is a report on how the City has utilized CDBG funds are uh, the four goals that the city has adopted as part of its consolidated plan. That's the guiding document for each five-year period. Uh, currently, we are in uh, the, well, we're in the fifth year. This report would be the fourth year of that five-year plan. And those goals are to expand economic opportunities, preserve affordable housing, prevent and address homelessness, and establish and maintain suitable living environments. Uh, as a reminder, suitable living environments is broadly community development. Often in terms of CDBG, we will see that show up with public services, public facilities, things that aren't specifically tied to the other goals, but <coughs> to add um, enrichment and, and benefit progress for lower income households and individuals in the city. Our program year follows the calendar year. So in 2023, the city expended 834,000 $352 in CDBG funds. Um, the thing to note about our funding is in any given year, 15% of the total CDBG allocation can go to what's called public services. That's the direct service for low and moderate income persons. 20% is for planning and admin. And then the remainder, so 65% plus any prior year funds can be used for capital and economic development. Um, a couple projects that we'll talk about, you'll see um, where we've had struggles. We've talked to the City Council about those in the past. Um, HUD is also looking at adjusting how what we call a timeliness test is calculated. Um, so we have been untimely because of a couple of our larger capital projects uh, having delays due to environmental concerns and then with our housing repair and that transition to habitat. Uh, the future way that they'll be cal calculating timeliness, we actually would not be um, untimely and it will open the door if the city wants to explore some public fa public facility support, again, with the beneficiary being low and moderate income persons. Um, so you'll see some of that narrative in, in this caper and then um, in the future con plan, we'll carry that forward as well. In 2023, for capital and economic development, the housing repair program completed three repairs with three additional repairs in progress. That's pretty typical for the city, um, a city, 
program, we would have liked to have had those three finished. We were unable to uh, procure contractors that were qualified for that work. Um, Habitat, on, on the other hand, is now our provider for that housing repair program. That was a, an accomplishment in 2023. And they are already uh, working on procuring the services for a number of homes in 2024. So we should see that number um, continue to go up. Technical assistance was provided to 41 businesses, including both established microenterprises and startups. This was through Highline and their economic development programs. And with Fusion, we had two transitional housing unit acquisitions. Um, these are for families coming out of homelessness. Um, to so far, so in, in the first program year, they had a total of six individuals enter into those units. Um, and those will retain their affordability for 15 years. And Fusion will tend to retain longer, but that's the requirement with CDBG funds. In 2023, for public services, we had a total of 158 uh, residents served. Uh, job training was provided to 26 individuals through two different training programs. 19 of those uh, individuals were able to obtain jobs by the end of the program year. There were a number who were still in receiving services or hadn't yet obtained jobs. 128 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities received training, other um, life skills, enrichment activities through the inclusion program at the community center. Uh, financial counseling was provided to eight individuals and housing stability support via eviction prevention or move-in assistance was provided to 12 families. Uh, just for a comment on the timeline, we had a public comment that concluded on March 19th. Um, we only received comments from our commissioners and they were through the Human Services Commission process and not a uh, comment on the, um, the, the CAPER. Um, the public hearing was held on February 26th and uh, consideration this evening before council. We will submit this to HUD no later than March 31st. So the options and recommendation. The option one, approve the proposed 2023 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. Or option two, do not approve the proposed 2023 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report and provide direction to staff. Uh, the mayor recommends option one. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Councilor Marissa do you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you, Sarah. My question is with the uh, aerospace and, and uh, construction 26 individuals, 19, that's a 73, 70 some percent, which is really high. So it's, it's, I would consider that success. But is part of their program job placement or are the people responsible to find their own? Uh, both programs actually have job placement as part of their program. Okay. So do you know if the rest are still looking or they just did not complete the program? Um, I, I don't know um, specifically. I, I would say that based on um, the fact that there were new enrollments in quarter four, that uh, a number of those individuals are still in the program. Uh, for instance, a new is a 13-week um, apprenticeship program, I believe. So if they enroll in quarter four, they're still receiving service. Same with Orion. Um, I don't believe they have a 100% success rate, but uh, often we would see that be a little bit higher. Thank you. Great. Councilor Tran, do you have a motion? Um, I move approval of the 2023 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report as re uh, represented. Second. Been a motion. A second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Matter passed unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. Council President, do you have a motion with regard to the time? Uh, I make a motion to extend the meeting past 10 p.m. Second. Second. Uh, there's been a motion. A second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? They say we hurry and not need to do it. Exactly. <laughs> I'm working on it. All right. All right. So uh, opposed? Don't hear anybody. Pass, matter passes unanimously. Council reports. Uh, Council Member Dovey. Yeah. The only thing I have to report is that we added, or two things. We're going to add to our next LUTC meeting a part to talk about airports. See the thumbs up. That's good. And uh, tomorrow, I believe it is, is our second financial uh, literacy class. We'll have nine graduates. And then we have the third one going from the Washington State Employees Credit Union going with great success. So uh, we've got two classes now down with graduates and one going and two more coming. So it's been a successful program so far. 
Very good. And thank you for your help with that. Councilmember Walsh. Yeah, I, I just like to second what uh, Councilmember Dovey said with that, with the, the financial uh, uh, <laughs> program. I mean, great success. Uh, next, with, when uh, they were giving all the stats on 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 the uh, um, housing first program, it made me think. I, you know, one of our big concerns right now is the day center. What kind of metrics does the day center have? I mean, what what, what is their what is their measure of success? What should be their major success? I would say that we should uh, ask them for some sort of report on what uh, on what what they're doing and their success rate and what they call success and maybe what they should call success. So I'd, I'd suggest that we bring that be brought to the council. Okay, uh, Brian. Let's talk about that tomorrow in regard to uh, whether you know we have any ongoing funding uh, for them that that would trigger any kind of um, uh, leverage for a request uh, other other than just the record the, the basic request for a separate organization let's talk about that tomorrow yeah thank you uh, other than that I would just like to say hey uh, it was great being with uh, with you all last week at the uh, in DC I think that it was a successful uh, a successful outing hopefully it will there will be a return in dollars and uh, and what you're saying about uh, with uh, um, with Jim uh, Ziegler, I mean, boy, he provided a, as I say, it, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Yeah, it really was. So, anyway, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Tran. Um, thank you, Mayor. So, um, so last week, uh, I was uh, lucky to spend four or five days uh, with most of you in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, I've been in this country for 40 plus years, but this this is the first time that I actually spent more time in Washington D.C. than than you know anywhere else. Um, there's so much that I want to share, but uh, I'm going to just share one thing, and that that is um, at times it was a little bit emotional for me um, because when I walk on that Senate floor, I reflect for the last 40 plus years that I'm here, who would have thought that 40 years ago there was a 19 years old young man came to this country with a shirt on his back, no English, no job skill, and that one day was lucky enough to put, you know, my foot on the Senate floor, U.S. Senate floor. I am so grateful beyond um, anything. Um, and this has only happened in America. So I am very, very grateful to be here. And, and thank you. Well, thank you. I do have to, you know, I, I actually, I, I thought your comment to the congressman really, you really broke the ice, and you could just tell the whole, the whole uh, feeling of the meeting really relaxed. Um, so that was, it was really nice. Thank you, um, Councilmember Honda. Thank you. I would like to suggest that as a council, we have a debrief on NLC, what happened, what we would do differently, if anything and that we meet in groups of three to do that since we can't meet in groups of six. Um, and I, you know, this is my third or fourth time of going to CCC conference and I w I'm involved in other things at NLC, so I was pretty busy, but uh, I think it would be really useful to us as a council to continue to grow and to, um, to just have a debrief and to um, to write down what we would do, what we wouldn't do, and then create a report for the public so that the public knows what we did and what we accomplished there. And we're not going to know exactly what funding we've we've gotten for for a while, but I do think that we got the message across what our needs were. And so um, anyway, I would highly suggest that that we do this. Um, 
Before we went to, to DC, I had the chance to read to a kindergarten class at Camelot Elementary. Amy was there right before I was there. And I was going to read one book. The class picked out the book, and then this cute little angel in front of me, this little boy, says to me, can't you just read two books to us? So <laughs> I read two. They tried to get three, but the teacher said, no, no, we have recess. And then I wasn't as important as recess. Mm -hmm. But um, they're, they were really cute. Um, congratulations to the Lions Club for 70 years of making an impact in federal way. Uh, service groups are the backbone of this city. And um, if you're not involved in one, you should be involved in one. There are several I could recommend to you. Um, the Lions Club. Around this time of year, I always uh, think of their Easter egg hunt that they used to do at Still Lake Park, and uh, that was a great event for the community. Wish they would, were still doing that, but I understand why they're not. Anyway, my report. Thank you. Great, Councilman McDaniel. Thank you. Um, I'm going I'm to follow off of uh, Councilmember Chan over there. Um, last week, going to D.C. is the first time I've been to D.C. myself, and it was nice seeing some of the uh, scenery and actually being in uh, such a historic place. Um, uh, I went to the uh, the, N N the NLC with a certain mindset and um, what I thought I was going to get out of it. And I got something completely out different. Out. I thought I was going to go learn about grants, how to get money out of the government. I didn't learn any of that stuff. What I did learn is sitting down and talking to people in different states, different cities, they have the same problems. And it was nice to sit there and talk to somebody who's in a completely different part of the country, have the same problems, but then hear what they have for some of the um, solutions they had. And I've actually collected a few names with a few of the other council members of people that we're going to actually reach out to and try to share some ideas. And the other thing it gave me some perspective on was um, I technically have like 18 months in my mind on this seat. And then anything after that is just grace period. I spent 11 minutes today writing down what I want to do in the next 18 months. And basically what I wrote down is the stuff I heard from the council that I agreed with. I wasn't elected. I was selected. I was selected by people sitting up at this council. So in my mind, I look at it a little bit different. I'm a person who's literally off the street sitting up here because of the people sitting up here. So I spent time talking to almost everybody who was there over the time and got a perspective of where they came from, how they got up here, and what they think is important to them. And um, for the next 18 months, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for some of these guys' ideas up here. And that includes land banking. It includes looking at police versus Social Security workers, the senior center, uh, broadening our economic development, and then community. I, I mentioned it beforehand. I believe in one flag, one family, and that's something I will push uh, as long as I'm up here to uh, have the opportunity to speak on it. But um, I learned a lot last week, and um, the other thing I learned is next time I step on the Senate floor, I'm touching a desk. <laughs> <laughs> you might get arrested. I'm so afraid I was going to touch a desk. Councilor Sevadasan. And I did touch a desk. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't aware I did it until it was brought to my attention, so I'm sorry. Anyway, yes, um, again, this trip was really great and to be among um, with other council members and um, Council Member Hong, I think we're in the same boat when it comes to our experiences coming as uh, immigrants to, into this country and here we are sitting at this table um, uh, um, in leadership and also in policy uh, making. So yes, thank you for what you said. Um, from the financial literacy um, class, uh, one thing we did, um, not this past week because we were in D.C., but the week prior, <laughs> um, there was a part that's, um, where she asked people to write letter to money, and it was very funny. It's dear money, and then you just write a, a statement, and it was very funny, by the way, but it just shows people's relationship with money, and everybody's was really pretty similar. It's like, I don't like you. Hey, you have this. Uh, we have this toxic relationship, or whatever. But um, I do have through work. Also, I'm doing financial literacy and facilitating it. And so, tried that with the people that I, um, I was working with at work, and it was the same thing. We had about 40 some people, and their letter was just crazy, creative, and very um, um, again funny, but yet real about how people feel about money and and so. It comes up in a, in a very comical and easy way, but it's people's real experience with how they relate to finances and how um, your background and your history brings up um, or how you're raised really shows how you deal with, with your financial well-being. So it was, um, it was a great class. I'm going to plan to continue to um, participate as much as I can. Um, and so 
NLC, I think you're right. We need to, there's much debriefing to do because we all didn't attend the same workshops also. So I think um, you're correct, um, sharing ideas and then maybe um, having that somewhere um, where people could see, read, would be a great idea. So thank you so much. And with that, I end my report. Great, thank you very much. Council President Coach Martin. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, my ninth time to DC, nine times. Uh, every time it's been a little different, but this is the first time that the entire council went as a body. M most of the council went as a body, and I really have to thank Amy for, oh my goodness, all of the Ubers and the getting us all where we had to go. Thank you very much. And so um, very, very much appreciated. She was, she was exhausted by the, I mean, we were tired, but she was exhausted. But I think that, uh, Chanya, aren't you going to give a report at the FEDERAC meeting on uh, the many of the things that we did in D.C. and the, how the relationship works with the lobbying and the I'd be happy to add that into the grant writing uh, update and, and so we can certainly talk about that because it is okay. kind of part of the bigger picture. Okay, yeah. so um, I will talk with the mayor about um, debriefing and how that works in with what Anya is going to be presenting. And I want to say thank you to all of you for being so considerate of my little six-year-old granddaughter. I, I actually was a great granddaughter. I was actually surprised that she's, she, she made it an airplane and she put all the little windows on the airplane in the exit tonight because she was reliving her experience so but anyway thank you all for uh, it was a growing experience for her for she's being raised by uh, a grandfather who's all male uh, and uh, really needs help with uh, dressing like a little girl <laughs> but, she, but um, it was fun having uh, Zig Ziegler um, not Zig but Jim Ziegler um, he, he seemed to be quite taken with her. He had all boys, and his boys had boys. And so he bought a little pink shirt for her. It was very sweet. Uh, so I, I think we were very fortunate with our lobbying firm. They, they were absolutely excellent. And you, and you all know you got special treatment. Absolutely not like the normal NLC folks. So you were very fortunate in that respect. So we did the best we could for our community. Uh, and thank you, David, um, for going with us and all the pictures. Uh, which was very helpful when I went to the third grade class this morning. I was able to show them our um, thank you from Public Works for getting the uh, newsletter for me, and I could show them the pictures of going to Washington, D.C., and, and they, they were all there, and they said, oh, you're there, right there. <laughs> that was just two days ago. Uh, anyway, but thank you. Um, good teamwork. And so we did absolutely. I can't tell you how professional you all were. Much, much different than we've been in the past. For example, this is just a quick example. Mike Park and I went to D.C. when he was mayor and I was deputy mayor. We, we went two times before we figured out we weren't doing it right. And then by the third time, we figured out, wait a minute, you need a lobbyist. You know, other people are getting money. We're not. What are we doing wrong? Then we had to go five more times, uh, five years, uh, to get $12 million total. We accumulated it. And that went then into the seed money for the um, interchange by Costco. That money then was the seed money for the state to give us $120 million to build the half of the interchange over by Costco. We still have to build the rest of it, but that's how we did it. And so that's what you're doing. It's not a one and done. There's a process, and, and Tanya will explain how that works. But it's a process. It's over time. And you all were great about working toward that. And so thank, thank you all very, very much. All right. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Great work.